on the, um, I'm doing them on um, basically the Mac equivalent of PowerPoint. Um, the problem is, is that it blocks out my OBS when I do it. Um, like it basically takes up my entire monitor. There's no way to do, or both of my monitors in fact. So there's no real way to, to have a monitor that's got OBS like comfortable. Hey everyone, if you're here, hi. Hi. Hello. Yay. Hey. Oh, okay. We've actually got people already. Oh, what really? It? Yeah. What is it? Your. Your what? Holy Grail game. Oh yeah, your your gaming Holy Grail. Oh my God, I'm really drunk. Sorry. It's okay. Um, I'm really sober. Um, unfortunately. Oh no. Mitsu mitsu. And yeah. it's a very harsh contrast. Yeah. Um, so, how's everyone doing? I'm trying to get things loaded up, get things posted, wherever, trying to get people in here, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm just going to give it a couple moments. Oh my god, 10 people already? I know, right? Oh That's what I was saying. Do they know uh, what's going on? I'm so, I'm so, I'm <laughs> um, so embarrassed right now to be this drunk. It's okay. Um, it's um, stream drunk, edit sober. That's right. That's the rule. Oh, it's funny, your thing is a couple of, like, a, a number of clicks behind me. A number of clicks behind you? What do you mean? Uh, the updates on the thing. Oh, I think that's because it literally does not update. Give me a second. Okay. There we go. If you, okay. Yeah, if you change anything, it won't do it while I'm live. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay. Um, so again, we're going to give people a moment to come on in. Um, oh, that's a robot with a donut. Yes, that is in fact a robot with a donut. Oh, and she changed it to white. It was black a moment ago. It's really cute now. <laughs> I like the drop shadow on it. Yeah. Awesome. Your gaming holy grail. It's all my grail. Um, <laughs> the um. It's all my teaching hacks where you have to do all of your your worksheet shit on fucking PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah. She basically no. worked in PowerPoint and Microsoft Word when um those were probably the worst possible software to work in. Okay. In fairness, I worked in them in Japanese too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The there menus were no, all in Japanese. That is fine. That is fine. Like I. I don't think PowerPoint is a bad software. <laughs> well, it, it can be. It can be a little clunky. It's not the worst, and it's definitely not the best. But it's not like it's. It's not the best, but also like it's the best if you think that your designs are going to be replicated by just like corporate people. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's good for it's good for presentations. It's good for what it does. Okay. Yeah. Like, so if um, they tell you if they tell you to do a presentation, you can you can only do it in PowerPoint because they are not going to be able to use any other software. Yeah, but the lack of alternatives doesn't mean it's good. It just means it's what you've got. <laughs> um, but yeah, she was doing it in Japanese. Like uh, she was on a Japanese computer, and all the menus were in Japanese, which is you know annoying. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen any software in Japanese, but oftentimes um, it is not designed for it. Um, so a lot of times the um, like the space where the name goes it doesn't even fit the word. Um, it just like overflows and it's very complicated and very annoying. Um, oh no. Yeah, but it doesn't matter because we're not using PowerPoint tonight. We're using um, fucking Mac, whatever you call it's it. It's the same thing. It's basically the same thing, but it's in English. That is a big advantage. It's in the it's in the language it was designed in, which is good. Well, particularly the one I can read. Well, that too. <laughs> The, um, okay, so, everyone, howdy, um, let's see here, okay, actually, we got a lot of viewers, that's good, that's good. Hey, y'all. Right. So, hi, how's everyone doing tonight? They're to see me drunk. Yeah, that's definitely it. Um. No. So, um, oh. Tonight we're doing a little experiment. We're doing a, a new sort of show. Um, 
where we are going to be talking about gaming in a in a couple of different ways. Um, the the sort of pilot experiment for this that I wanted to try, Philomena wanted to try, we wanted to experiment here with was um, that for the first hour we would talk a little bit about some some gaming discourse. Not necessarily like whatever people are talking about on Twitter, not, although... Not drama. Yeah, not drama. Discourse. Discourse, yeah. Um, or disc course. And in this case, it's just a random thing I pulled out of my apps. Um, in the future we might try to do some stuff that's like topical. Um, and like specifically topical, uh, but you know we'll see we'll see how it goes. Ask discourse. Yeah, ask discourse is good. Um, so we'll do that, and um, so that's the first hour. We're going to talk a little bit about stuff, and then basically hour two and three, we're going to do um, a little bit of advice and discussion about things. Um, I don't fucking know. Um, Basically, we're gonna we're gonna in tonight, for example, we're gonna be giving a primer on how to run fate. Spilling the lukewarm tea. That's right. Yeah, spilling lukewarm tea. That's fucking right. So we're spilling the tea that like you forgot in the microwave. Yeah. But you made it, so it's sitting in there. So you like you microwave it a couple of other seconds to like warm it up again, and it's it's just not the same. It's it's not great, uh, but <laughs> but it's it's certainly um, it's certainly tea by certain definitions. <laughs> now, um, my, my, as far as like the the current discourse, whatever it is that people are talking about, if, if we do talk about that, what I want to do is I want to depersonalize it a little bit. Instead of going at the specific people and their arguments or whatever, I want to talk about that in, in how it relates to game design and game publishing and stuff like that. Um, because there's usually a good discussion to be had, it just doesn't happen on Twitter. Um, Twitter is a shitty place to have conversations. It is. And it's most certainly, like, anything that, like, has lasting gravity in people's lives, yeah. Um, and, like, you don't even have um, PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, we don't. What and, is it called on Mac? I don't know. I don't even know. Don't even it's know. It's called Keynote. keynote. <laughs> yeah, the Mac Mac Keynote is what it's called. Francita, read the, the general Discord, please. Sorry. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, yeah Keynote, I, I like Keynote a little bit better than... I think it's cleaner. Yeah, it, it definitely works better. Yeah, and it's it's inherently very pretty. Like, yeah. it does things very quick, very... And it's hard to make something that looks bad. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's a thing. Um, okay. For, Sorry. For those of you... It's okay. I will fix it right It's now. okay, Mina. It's okay. We're... Uh, I'm very drunk. I'm so sorry. Don't so sweat I it. guess it's... I guess it's okay because like you will have to teach someone to run fate when they are like very much not in their senses. Well, that's so, the best like, time to do it. If I can learn it, yeah. If I can learn it, anyone can learn it. Um. Yeah. Like in a kung fu movie, the scene where um the 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 training montage where the character has to learn to fight while blindfolded. It's like that, basically. Um, yeah. So yeah, um. I'll say that. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the thing. So the, the silly discourse item that I wanted to talk about tonight, the thing that I wanted to bring up was a tweet that I posted the other day. Um, it was a sort of an experiment to begin with, but it got really popular. So I decided that I would, um, try to talk about it a little bit more, um, and just talk about the things that people brought up and maybe our own answers to the issues. Um, Uh, this is all you. Okay, so let's see. <laughs> Sorry. I posted, what I posted was, what is your game holy grail? What's the thing that you want so very hard to see in gaming, but you don't? And I said that this applies to tabletop. What? Romance. Okay. Tabletop or digital gaming? Tabletop. Okay. Well, I mean, that wasn't the question inherently. <laughs> but she's got the answers for you, so. Yeah. No. Like I, I've seen it on on like digital game, and of course, like the the BioWare uh, games always have romance options and stuff. Yeah. It's not great. No. But, like it's there. And then uh, there's Solus. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. But in like in, in tabletop gaming. I, I have never, like never, and I'm, I mean never, gotten 
uh, romance uh, game, like a, a romance option in a game where it wasn't weird for the table. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's a difficult one and one that, I guess, I have seen that happen in tabletop games occasionally. I, I hate to toot our own horn as far as these things go, but I'm gonna. Uh, Please do. Yeah, I don't know if anybody remembers, but we did a game a while ago called Amaranthine. Yeah, we did. And that was like a, a high swords fantasy Highlander, but it was like lots of romance. And I don't know what, I mean, I do know what it was about the game that like very easily established, okay, our characters were in love 100 years ago. It's literally a core mechanic. Right. One of the core mechanics is that you have to establish... Uh, uh, relationship with the other characters by saying we've always we've never we've once and we've sometimes mm -hmm. and you fill in that i don't remember if that was exactly it but you would say some statement like oh okay francine and my character we've never fell in, fallen in love but we've once kissed yeah and that's such a like a i don't know that's such a heavy statement to make about our our history together yeah that like it immediately tells the players, okay, strap in, that's what we're playing. Yes, absolutely. And it's um, it was a thing that you had to like engage in play. Right, there was no there was no ignoring it and paying attention to your faco because it was a part of character creation. Yeah, just basically doing the um doing doing the basic dice rolling, doing the like, you know, doing a combat even would involve um, like flashbacks and stuff to those moments so it was a big deal now like there are games where that is the core focus blue rose right um i don't even think that blue rose puts it as a core focus like mm. blue rose is still ultimately a d20 game yeah um and like i don't think that it even has any mechanics that suggest those things like other than a couple of superficial ties and stuff and if it does let us know yeah please i've never played it i read the first edition i didn't read the second edition mm. um Sometimes reading the first edition makes me not read the second, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's a thing. Um, and I, again, like there are games that really do focus on it. I'm sure that like, I'm sure the like the Thirsty Sword lesbian game probably does that, but that's like right there on the label. Um, in other games, right. like in traditional like action adventure games where like it's a possibility, I do think that it is sometimes difficult because it is a distraction sort of from the what we would consider like the real mechanics, like the real game itself. Um, if you have a game and it doesn't have any way, like if you if there's no way to roll dice and use computers, then the characters probably won't be hackers. Or if they are, they're going to be disappointed because they're not going to be doing any hacking. Right. That's a that's a big thing, I think. Well, and it's kind of you've got to build your game to what you want the characters to be doing. So, like, I hunt is great. Do I think I could do an episode, a single episode that somehow emulates the Great British Bake Off? Maybe. Do I think I could make a game out of that using I hunt as it is? No. 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 That would be silly. What a lot of work. Yeah, that would be <laughs> that would be extremely difficult. Um, and like you know more power to people who do that sort of thing, but it, it is it is challenging and you are doing it in spite of the game, not because of the game. Um, or And it's like that, it's the it's the same phenomenon that you get whenever someone's like, well, I want a puzzle game. And they're like, oh, well, play D&D. &D. D &D's a puzzle game. And like, okay, well, where's the puzzles? Well, you have to add them all yourself. Like, okay, but like, that's not D&D. &D, so, um, and that's, that's, that's a thing that like, I think that we run into that trap in gaming a lot of times because we know that we can sort of hack and mod and play with things as we want. We're all very clever monkeys. There's yeah. nothing you can't do with a game. Like I, And sometimes it's like from a designer angle, whenever somebody says, well, you can't do X in Y, my instinct is to go, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I bet I could. I bet it'll <laughs> suck, but I bet I could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. That's sort of my take on that. And I think that, I think that there's room to do that, and I think that there's, it would take a good balance. And this is like... You know, I think that we should do Amaranthine Second Edition, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. We'll, we'll have to do that down the line. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe, yeah. maybe later in 2021. Um, Can we yeah. finish some of the things we're doing? No. I have. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I've had experiences both as player and as GM trying to do something romantic-like in a game. Yeah. 
and um, both times have gone pretty like sadly. Mm-hmm. Well, did the game engage it in uh, any way? No, they didn't engage. So, like, I think, think, um, so I think, uh, discussing what you want in your game beforehand is very important. Yes. Yeah. But I think that in, in these things, we really have to find the right game to do the thing that we're going to do. Like, or at least we have to oh, find a game that will allow it. If, like, yeah. games are really, like, games are really, like, they're mind control, they're influence. Um, and if the game doesn't have any sort of way to model that, then it tells the players that that's not important. And so that's just like, yeah, that's a thing. Yeah, like D and D wants to like play at being like, okay, we have these three phases that are like exploration, mm -hmm. playing, and combat, and like they they want to play at that. Yeah, but like. No, you're not. You're a combat game and just like own up to it. And yes. you're not a role playing game and you're not a like a exploration game. You're a combat game. Yes. You're a combat simulator that likes to do some role playing and exploration or whatever. But like what you do best combat, so own up to it. Yes. And frankly, I think that like the the idea that the idea that what builds D and D is those three sort of pillars, um, there is some support for the other side of it, and at least there is the sort of social contract that you are you should expect those things to come up in play. Right. So we we know that those are important, and we do we do see like how they are supposed to work, um, and if you just tack on um, romance to that, that's not going to work. What you would need is to have its own series of pillars. And, I, of course, ironically, if you're doing a romance game, you can have exploration, you can have role-playing, and you can have combat. Um, I, I don't know how the combat fits into that, but it does. Well, it did in Amaranthine. Yeah, it does. It did in Amaranthine a whole bunch, actually. <laughs> um, but, like, you can... The, the, the direct engagement, the, like... Explo exploring what the, the sort of meaningful sort of s consequences and like uh, the, the sort of the gravity of it, that would be the equivalent of the combat pillar. And unless you have support for the same depth, then people aren't going to do it. Like, it's just that, like, you can, you if you have rules for how to use a computer and they take up a paragraph in a book, and then you have rules for combat and they take up 90 pages in a book, people aren't going to really be convinced by that either. I feel like we've had this argument with certain specific games, but sure, yeah. I, I think the other thing to keep in mind is when you're talking about your Holy Grail game, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want, if you want a Holy Grail game, you don't want an Ark of the Covenant game. You, want, <laughs> wait, okay. you, you don't need the Spear of Longinus game. Sure. And if what you want is the Holy Grail, and what you get is the Spear of Longinus, you can't live forever, you can only stab Jesus. Yes. Right? Yeah, I think so. Right. So at some level, if I there is a... <laughs> <laughs> on some level, you have to play the game that does the thing. And yeah. if it doesn't do the thing, and you're expecting it to, you're going to be unhappy. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think. I th no. I agree with that. I think that's a good point. I think, um, and I think that that's gonna oh, that's gonna be important across everything that we're doing here. Like everything that we're talking about here, that's gonna be relevant. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm gonna pull up a couple of others, and then I'm gonna ask you for one, and mm -hmm. I'm gonna pitch my own. Um, how's everyone doing? Like everyone going, doing cool? Like. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's that, that's 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 a great start, Francita. Um, so someone says here, um, Guy McLinmore, uh, McLinmore, McLinmore, it's probably McLinmore, says, I want an RPG um, designed from the ground up to be supported by a comprehensive modular tablet-based GM and player support system for both face-to-face -face and online play. I think that would be really cool, yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a holy rail. Yeah, that's, that's I, a thing. I've played a lot around with how, how for years, yeah. How do you make your tabletop game playable in internet spaces? And like yeah. people do it, but nobody is really making games with that in mind. Um, what's the one about the spaceship? 
But what about the spaceship? There's one that you're supposed to do like in a Zoom call or whatever that's literally about like people being trapped on a spaceship oh. that's falling apart. I don't know, but that's really cool. I'm going to see if I can find it. Yeah, see like, if you can. That's the first of that I ever heard of. Yeah, I think that a lot of times whenever whenever we talk about these things, we develop them in in spite of or um, the the actual setup of the game. Like we're trying to accommodate both um, instead of designing from the ground up, which is exactly what he's talking about here. Uh, and that sounds super cool. Like that sounds really fascinating. Um, next one. I want a fantasy game where magic is a programming language disguised with magic looking stuff, and you have to reverse engineer the language to write new spells. I think that's a neat idea. Um, I think that from a from a digital standpoint, that's similar to the way that um, Morrowind and Oblivion did spells. Like you sort of like assemble them out of pieces, and then oh, what? The dragon shots, especially, right? Oh yeah, I mean those are those are like very specific things though. But like in in Oblivion, you make spells, and it's like four elements that you piece together. Yeah. And like you can make some weird shit. Like you can make like. Yeah. It makes your armor invisible. Like, what the fuck do you care? Like, who cares? You can make worthless spells. Yeah. Um, but then you can also make really cool broken ones. Um, let's see, next one. Crunchy community development and resource management that isn't any sort of colonial or imperialist exploitation fantasy. Oh, hey, that's Flatpak. Hmm, what? Me? <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, so that's convenient. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that would be like a real time strategy that isn't about war. Yeah, basically. They're probably looking for something a little heavier than flat pack. But that's yeah. probably true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's interesting. Spoilers: the mascot for flat pack is floating right there on your screens right now. Is she? Yeah. Oh, on the left. Yeah, yeah I forgot that. That's she's the screen. pointing for us. Yeah. Uh, somebody was saying that Burn Bright was specifically designed for Roll Twenty, so it's designed to be played online. Oh, that's cool. I really need to see it played. I haven't seen it played yet. Yeah, yeah, seriously. I, that's that's fascinating to me. Can uh, you make boilerplate spells? Is that your basic fireball? Yeah, of course. Like, there would definitely be a, a best practices list, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the fuck? Um, so, yeah, that's, that's that one. Um, hmm. Having trouble minimizing my, my fucking window thing. Yeah. Sorry, uh, totally aside, but for online play or whatever, a game of no armies where the characters have to communicate through, like, Skype for whatever reason. Oh, yeah. Like, you could very easily machinate a reason why the characters can never meet in person. Yeah. So they're both in character and out of character on a Zoom call or whatever. Oh, gosh, you know what would be really cool? Yeah. Doppelgangers. Doppelgangers. If they were all doppelgangers and if they see each other in person, they destroy each other. Right. Yeah, that would be cool. But they have to coordinate. Because... Yeah, they're still working on something together. Yeah, I love that. Okay, next one. Um, John Bateman here says, more world-building games with alternatives that don't involve global war or other outdated constructs of colonial, colonial conquest. Um, also, summer days playing cards with my cousin and grandmother when no one got jealous um, at someone else's win. <laughs> he says, but you, you said holy grail, so. But yeah, so more community and civilization building. Um, yeah. That that's, seems to be a common one. Okay, um, sorry, yeah, I uh, found it. The game I was thinking of is called View Screen. A couple of people mentioned it in the chat. Thank you very much. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. And I'll post a link that to them in the chat. Mm -hmm. That might be your holy grail. Mm -hmm. By all means, check it out. Um, like the ship is falling apart and people are going to die. Like, it's really, like, good good tragedy porn. I like that. Yeah. It's cool. Um, okay. Somewhat, um, Joel, the Mad GM, says, uh, experience-wise, I really wish more video games would take the Rocket League approach of it's soccer but with cars. I wish there were more games you could look at and break down as it's a sport with a cool gimmick. They're more fun to watch than the real sport. I absolutely agree. Yeah. Mm. I like to blaze ball. Yeah. Blitzball, not Blitzball. Blitzball, the, Blitzball. the Final Fantasy one. Yeah, I, I had a lot of fun with that. I don't know that I ever figured out how it worked, or what I was actually <laughs> supposed to be doing, but... But it was cool. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, um, let's see. And then the next one in my comments is Francita saying romance in all caps. Um, we already addressed that one. And then Mikel, Im improv GM, says, 
For CRPGs, I'd like to see more that feel like an actual RPG where players have massively different experiences depending on what roads they go down. He says, Disco Elysium and Age of Decadence are the only ones I've found so far. And short emotional experiences like Gone Home, Eat a Finch, etc. Yeah. People are so articulate on their like questions and stuff, and I was like, Kermit! I think that I think that whenever you ask someone their ideal and they sit down and think about it, they usually can express it pretty eloquently because it's important to them. If it's like an actually a thing that they value, then they can usually address Romance that. Romance is important to me too. Well, that's um, fine. You communicated it very clearly. Like, and you did outside of just a tweet. The tweet was all in caps, but you managed to explain yourself pretty well. Um, Thank you. You're very, yeah. very, you are being very understanding of me. And the next one, Callum says, more role-playing in RPGs and less world quests. I don't know, but maybe I'm playing the wrong RPGs. I haven't really felt as if a character was mine since the first Dragon Age. Wow. Fable. Um, Fable, yeah. I, I, um, I get that feeling out of um, some, like the Bethesda games, I tend to, to get a little bit of that. Uh, but yeah, that's really hard in computer RPGs. Uh, Fallout New Vegas is probably the best in that regard because you don't, like, you're not really forced down a path at all. Um, so you do get to play around a little bit. But um, I think that, I think that, like, I haven't played Disco Elysium, but I've heard really good things about that. And I imagine that that probably works pretty well in that regard. I don't know. I think that's your problem with Valhalla. With Valhalla? Yeah, it's kind of the opposite situation entirely because it's very much like, why can't I just stab this guy? I know he's going to betray me. Yeah, so yeah. So the role playing is so limited because it's... And it's weird because the game does offer some choice, but just not in the places that I think are impactful. Right. Um, and like, there, there, there actually is valuable choice. Like there are consequences to choices and stuff in ways that you, like Bioware does not do. Yeah. Uh, but not the places that I really want to. Yeah. Um, and that's very much like the classic gamer um, scene where like you see the villain and the villain starts doing their monologue and you're like, all right, I'm going to shoot an arrow at him. Um, like you can't really do that in most computer RPGs, although you can do it. Four seconds. That's a, time, that's a turn. I have yeah. enough time to pull my arrow. <laughs> Please go watch The Gamers. Yeah, The Gamers is a very good movie. <laughs> um, the second one, I think, is a lot better, I like the second one a lot. But... Yeah. Um, but in um, in New Vegas, you can do that. Like, you could just stop in the middle of a conversation and murder someone. Yeah. Or whatever you got to do. Um, which is good. Which is good. Um, Jen, uh, angst here in the, usually in the chat, I don't know if Jen is currently here, but... Says, Wherever you are, hello, Jen. Yeah, I'm not looking at the chat right now because I don't have a good way to look at it. Yeah. Um, Jen says, I'd love a modern JRPG that I could play in small chunks and not get lost. Something I don't have to grind for hours to get everything in the game. I imagine I would uh, have difficult but not unreasonable battles and no random battles at all. I would love to see like a more episodic JRPG in that regard. Well, they do do them. Like, isn't that the whole shtick with... Um... The one with the, the maid lady with the thing on her eyes, and she's got a boy toy that she beats up. Your Automata? Though? That's the one. Yeah. That, Isn't yeah. that episodal? And, like, the whole, the whole gag of it is, like, you go through a, an episode, and if you didn't complete it the way you wanted it to... You go back. You go back. That's right, yeah. So I can fully I, do I have a game. question, though. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. How, do you make, how do you make, like, romance, like, happen in a tabletop RPG? Because it usually plays where very well with like uh digital games where you're playing alone oh god um but like how do you make it work with a group of people that are there like wait okay so that's the thing like that's the thing that we were talking about about the game rules if the game actually addresses that problem and actually makes it important to the game and like you see it up front it's like on the label, it's in, it's in the rules, and like the things that you're doing, the things that you are rolling dice for, the things that you're putting on a character sheet, the things that you are engaging actively as a part of the game, not just as a part of the story that you're playing, then people will be more comfortable with it. Like you have people like, it's not like people are particularly comfortable with like killing monsters, it, but 
In the game, when you're rolling dice and you have these stats in front of you, you're engaging the game and that gives you a degree of separation and abstraction. And it even, like, it, it, it removes a little bit of the culpability because it's the game that's doing it. It's not just you. Um, whenever it's whenever you're doing romance in a group of people and you don't have the game rules to support you and to sort of hide behind, it can be it can be a pretty stressful and taxing thing. I think a lot of us are socialized to not be particularly like romantic and flirty in a group. Um, how 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 would the game allow that? Well, that's a, it's a good question, and Some I think of it has to be about in and out. Too. Yes. So if I have mechanics that allow me to feel comfortable that like it, you need the mechanics to allow you to be vulnerable, but also to turn off the vulnerability if you want. Yes. So you need to have like very hardcore, like, okay, scene's done. Um, okay, that didn't happen. Okay, I'm not as impacted by this scene, the, the events of that scene, because I don't feel like role playing it. Um, or like hand wavy things of like, well, let's just skip over the part where I'm, I'm distraught over the, the broken relationship. Um, so th there has to be, there has to be systems that let you into those situations mm -hmm. and systems that let you be out of them if you don't want to engage them. Mm. I would think of right. the, the, Oh yeah. Yeah. I never thought about it like that, but like that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, one of the things that we saw a lot of in like, in like World of Darkness, yeah, was like roll to seduce. Roll to seduce. Yep. Yeah, and it was like you roll a bunch of dice, and if it succeeds, then that person wants to fuck you, basically. And like, well, that wasn't even the weird. Like that, the weirdest stuff was like, I've been an absolutely deplorable monster the whole time, but I've made a bunch of dice rolls, and now you like me. Yes. Like, that's nonsense. I, you know, there has to be a hard mm -hmm. limit on that kind of thing. Otherwise, you, right. nobody is right. going yeah. to engage with the intimacy of an in-character relationship unless they know that they can't be forced into something they don't want. Yes. And if you don't, right. it's like, it's like, I, I, go ahead. I am, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so I'm playing a game of 30s or lesbians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um... And in that game, there are rules. Uh, in the, like, there are some moves about being smitten with someone, uh, and they do different things for each playbook. So it's it's been it's been a real like different kind of experience for me because for once that is a very new thing for me. Like uh, like taking feelings into consideration in a role-playing game where I'm you have to know that I come from a background of D&D &D games mm, mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is like stupid D&D &D brain just like wants to have everything written down in character sheet for me to just like put up and, and like air quotes compel in the in play um, mm. so like uh if my character in last session for example i wa i was going to deflect or like uh defend against an attack yes and I, and i was like how can i do that i don't have a shield i don't have anything in my inventory where is even the inventory in this yeah <laughs> we were playing uh, uh, 30 sword lesbians is a uh, powered by the apocalypse game mm. so like I was like where is my inventory I don't I where like and then I realized like this is not what this is about like it's always uh, it's it's only important what I'm doing it's not important how I'm doing it well if if the, the character sheet is communicating that to you and it's telling you what the game is successfully, yeah. then you probably shouldn't have a lot of that conflict. Um, if it's a little bit like, right. if it's a little bit on the vaguer side, like if it doesn't, if it's not bold and expressive, then that can typically be a problem. Um, I don't know how that game runs specifically and I don't know what the character sheet looks like. Um, 
But I know Powered by the Apocalypse characters, and like typically they kind of wear on their sleeves what they are. You have a very limited list of things that you can do. Um, yeah, but like in that in that case where where I was at, like it didn't matter that I, um, for example, I was I was defending against an attack, and it didn't really matter if I just took like a garbage can lid and just use it as a shield. Yeah. Or like I pulled up a, a force field from my AI powers. Yes. It didn't really matter. Like, and, and I was very conflicted about that. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, like I, it didn't say in my character sheet that I had a power, uh, a force field. Yeah. But so that is that is like a very D and D kind of brain. Yeah, and ba basically, I think this is a weird one, but like the the real answer to that is you just got to get over it. Um, yeah, of course, of course. I I I, I it, it was like a brief thing. Yeah. A very brief thing, and I was just like, okay, I, I quickly realized that it didn't matter yeah. what I said. And uh, another thing that I think is this will be useful for players of fate or something like that is that don't be afraid of being wrong. Yeah. Because um, like in that in that scenario where I was at, if I said like okay, I pull up my force field I, and I deflect the attack. If uh, the game didn't allow for that in like some sort of way whatever like if the if the game was some some sort of way where i couldn't have a force field just out of the blue yes it doesn't matter like just do it and people will tell you mm -hmm. like this is not okay just change it and it's okay like the role playing games are if you're new to them or if you're new to the system or whatever it's a learning experience so don't be afraid to be wrong Absolutely. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back into some of these other tweets here. Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, oh, that the, one. The, I'm sorry. The thing about the complexity of engagement, right? Yes. If we had a game that was combat focused, and we went into the combat, and I was explaining to you the rules, and I was telling you, okay, the monster is gonna swing this at you, and you're gonna swing that at them, and you're gonna try to kill them. Yeah. Um, and then I said to you, okay, you take 45 damage. Yes. And you said to me, well, how do I stop getting 45 damage? That kills me instantly. Yeah. And I said, well, you don't. Yes. You know, like that, or, or like, well, it's one role, but it's not really well actualized. So we don't really, it doesn't really work. Yeah. Um, then you're not going to want to get into combat. Yeah. Right. So if the system doesn't tell you as the player, it's safe for you to explore X, mm -hmm. you most, well, some people will never explore X. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And some people will not want you to explore X because they're afraid that they're going to get splash damage, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, just wanted to... No, no, no. That. No, you're totally correct. And, and from the perspective of someone who has played a number of Powered by the Apocalypse games, um, I... I, yeah, somebody asked about Monster Hearts. Okay, Monster Hearts I don't think supports romance either for the same reasons. Um, I, I, I saw it some of... It supports getting turned on and yes. it supports like the complexity of, of teenage relationships as far as I can remember them. It was yes. a very long time ago. Um, but not the game, my being a teenager. Um, and I, I like that, but like that's not exactly the same thing as like a, a sweeping grandiose romance. It's not exactly the same thing as like adults doing, you know, the the dating thing. Yeah. It's it's its own thing, and just because there's kind of like arousal and sex involved doesn't mean it's romance. Yeah, there's definitely naive and juvenile sexuality. Right. Intentionally, Intentionally. and that's a good thing right, for right. what it is. And what... like the core um, uh, apocalypse. Apocalypse world, yeah. Apocalypse world, right? There's sex in that game. There's yeah. rules for sex in that game. That are supportive and, and protect you as much as you want them to. Absolutely. It's not a game of romance. Not even a little bit. It's it's just people who are desperate doing things with each other. Like that's cool. In that's fact, right. it's but the it's opposite. Not, yeah, it's not the same thing. Yeah. Unless you're playing the mask. <laughs> that is actual romance. Yes, that and is. Nothing else. To the the um 
the the thing about and like I, I didn't I haven't read the the current stuff on Thirsty Sword Lesbians, but I ha I did read some of the earlier discussions about moves and stuff like that. And it seems like it sort of has a very similar approach to the Apocalypse World and the Monster Hearts approach, which is sort of superficial, sort of fleeting moves that 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 do encourage flirtation and and immediate gratification, like engagement. Yeah. But there's it does it does certainly lack a certain amount of depth um, unless it's weaved into every little aspect of it. And like that's okay. It we're, is. We're not shitting on that. No, 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 no. But that's not like necessarily. Is it a game about romance? No. No. Is it a game about cool lesbians who are flirting and have crushes and fight? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's not the same thing. It does that. And that's cool. Do that. Do the thing that your game does. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a, that's a big important one. Because right. a lot of times what we're really talking about is, how do I make the, this game do something it's not? Right. And it's worth no noting, somebody asked in the in the chat, like, could you incorporate romance in the, if you're the GM? Oh, fucking course you can. Yeah. Can I, as a player, introduce romantic storylines and play romance to the hill? Yes, of course I can. We are creative monkeys. We can make a game do whatever we want it to do. Yeah. Um, the difference we're talking about between my GM can make this happen or I can make this happen a, as a player and the game is built for this, they're miles apart different. Yes. And there's nothing wrong with either option, but we're just saying that there aren't many games that really deeply dig into that is what that game is about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to jump into another one. Yeah, and we could absolutely talk some other time about how to introduce games, to, a romance into any game, how to support it in various types of games. We could do that, but that's a whole different discussion. Yeah, let's let's plan that for another stream. Maybe February. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, I've incorporated romance into Unknown Armies as a GM. Jen, that's right. <laughs> Unknown Armies is an inherently romantic game. It is. It is. <laughs> um, it, I, I, I absolutely agree. What is more agree. romantic than obsession? Well, I and absolutely. and like changing the world. And changing the world. It's a game true. about passion. Yeah. Um, and so that translates very well. Um, <laughs> Dear Greg, please let me make a hack of your game that's just kind of about getting it on. <laughs> so, okay, so next one is Raven. Raven says, aside from deeply heartfelt and philosophical talk about gender and identity, games where relationships develop very gradually between teammates and are reinforced mechanically in many small ways. Also games with clean, concise, deep stories that aren't pouted and bloated. So... Developing gradually between teammates, I actually really like that, and I think that, um, like that, you see hints of that in Powered by the Apocalypse with things like the, um, what the, the strings and stuff like that. Um, the you you mark the relationship, the RX or whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I and think it kind of wraps around, and the relationship changes as it does. I think that's dope. I do think that that's one of the more organic ways I've seen it done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because you do have to interpret it live and I stuff. I would say in I Hunt, the equivalent we have so far is that it's um, you're building selfies, so you're building basically moments that are memorable for you and another character, or mm -hmm. you about another character, and you call those back, mm -hmm. and they empower you and they move you forward. Um, so it's like, oh, remember that time in that um, cafe in France, that waiter? Mm -hmm. And when I remember that time... Jean-Luc. That's the one. Um, <laughs> when that happens, I'm more powered because I have built this slow relationship with the monsters in the city, the hunters that I hunt with, myself, all that kind of thing. So that's, you know... That's a big I'm not idea. saying I'm not saying I hunt has the answers. I hunt is about what it's about. No, no I'm no, just no. saying like that's where that's another place where you can kind of see that happening. Yeah, um, and then another one is especially that, but leaning deep into what it feels like to be living in a time that feels like the end of history. Well, that's the point of I hunt actually. Yeah. Uh, that is a thing. Um, games where the characters don't know that they're um, doing, but try or what they're doing, but try anyway, and know deep down that on the big scale it doesn't really matter that much. More, more of that pathos. That's actually an unknown armies thing. Um, that's a huge thing. Um, let's see, next one. That's not a holy grail. <laughs> a union. That's 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 good. Um, let's see. Comfortable city builder and god game where I can build a world with some friends and that has enough mechanical depth and creative space that I'll find it satisfying, but not so many attention demanding events that I can't pay attention to my friends or do my own thing. Again, we are we are coming back to this. People want 
Yeah, basically. Well, yeah. <laughs> like they, they want a, a non-combat RTS, which is cool. Um, Witcher and Elder Scrolls type open world games rooted in African culture and myth instead of European or East Asian. Yep. I would love that. I would I mean, really... they exist. Don't get me wrong. They exist. I can't pull up any off the top of my head, but... But not with there. that depth. Not yeah. with the, the AAA polish. Yeah. I would love to see that. Um... Let's see. There's some dope tabletop games in that space, though. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Nathan Hansen says, um, in digital, a party-based multiplayer-only RPG, so it could have the same kind of tailored story and feeling of afflicting the world, affecting the world as a single-player game with the camaraderie of an MMO. Yeah. That's actually kind of what I wish that they would have done with Fallout 76 a little bit more. Um, but on tabletop side, uh, Nathan says, rules and procedures that change based on game state. Oh, that's that would be really interesting, and I, I think that Blades in the Dark does that to an extent because it has different modes of play. Uh, but I do think that that like, and we the, the I guess the the prototype for this would be that um, back in the day we had BattleTech. Yeah. And eventually, uh, FASA made uh, Mech Warrior. Uh, that way, you could switch from the tabletop war game to playing your mech warrior pilots um, by themselves. And so there were literally two sets of rules that you were expected to be able to use together, right. um, depending on the game state. Um, I would love to see more of that, absolutely. Um, someone says, more collaborative tabletop games that are GM-less. I was stuck with forever GM syndrome whenever I wanted to try something new, but games like Wander Home, Sleep Away, and Grand Guignol are refreshing my love for gaming. I want more even if I have to write it myself. Yeah, that's a big fucking deal. Um, GM-less games are important um, for a lot of reasons, and I think socially they're important as someone who tends to be the one to run games. Um, that's a big deal. Why? Um, well, because sometimes if, if it is expected that you always run games, um, then you always run games. And sometimes you want to play them, but nobody wants to run them. So a gm list game offers you that opportunity without having to convince someone to run the game. So, right. yeah. That is very true. Um, next. Besides unionization of game developers, I mean, duh. Um, I wish the game industry in general would stop exploiting poorer countries for cheap labor, manufacturing and merch in the Philippines, and then selling them at overly um, inflated prices. Yeah, that's a thing. Um, two things. Being able to fully explore and interact with the world you're in. I want to explore a world's mythos, their history, etc., and not resorting to murder every chance you get. I found a two, few tabletop games that let me do the second one, but I wish it was more common. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, let's see, good mechanical support for generational role play, i.e., playing many generations of a character's family. I'm not sure about in computer games, but every tabletop game that claims to do this does it with mediocrity at best. Ha! Amaranthine does it, and it's like baked into well, the main but game. You're playing yourself, so it's not exactly the same thing. That is true. Yeah. And we don't. Re we didn't really expand out into. Okay, now you're playing yourselves again. Yeah. Which is definitely a thing to explore. I would love to do, like... We'll fix that. Doesn't Rain do that pretty well? I think so. R-E-I-H-E-N? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I've heard that that's really good for that. I know um, Pendragon is supposed to be, but... Um, Pendragon is also, like... Pendragon's not for me. Yeah, that's a good way I to put it. I would love to... I would, well, so one of the things that we've talked about on and off is, a, like, a, um, a sci-fi game set in one of the novels that I wrote. Yeah. Um, and, like, I think that would be an interesting space for that because you are literally playing um, a generational migrant ship who go, you know, find a planet somewhere to live on because their planet is toast. Um, and I think there'd be a lot of interesting room for, okay, now we're moving forward to generation because we've told some stories here and you're playing the children of that last generation. Here's some of the advancements they've made. Here's some of the fallback that's happened. Um, so now tell me what this world is like now that we're a second generation into it. A third, a fourth. Mm. Um, that would be dope. I would love to do that, yeah. Microscope, um, yeah, microscope is a good call as far as that goes, too. Believably complex ecosystems and biology, also games dealing with stuff like climate change that don't do things like assuming that no fossil fuels equals no technology. I, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. I would like to see more of that. Um, and not just a, a, a background setting thing, but then again, like 
science fiction is complicated. Um, actually, Nibiru um, does not use fossil fuels, and it does not equal no technology. It's immensely cool technology, um, and it's baked into the setting so well. It's very, 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 very good. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's nibirurpg.com or something. I don't know. I'll find it. Um, so Adam Weller says, a magical button that takes away the stress of finding and scheduling players. <laughs> yes. Um, Quad Sorry, Corpse. we can't help. Quad Corpse says, social combat with intuitive enter and exit states. Ironically, that's kind of similar to what you were talking about with romance earlier, Mina. So, sorry, one more time. Um, social combat with intuitive enter and exit states. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I wrinkle, I, I get real fussy when people use the phrase social combat. Yeah. I get what they're saying, but like, mm, I don't know. Mm -mm. Oftentimes it's too much frame like um, debate club. Yeah, which is not how actual social interactions work. Unless all. you're Aaron Sorkin. And none of us are. Uh, there's Nibiru. I posted it in the... Um... Oh, good, good, good. Um, Nibiru is one of my favorite games of all time. It's brilliant. I was the editor for it, and Walking it's amazing. Walk talk, baby. That's right, John. It's, it's amazing. Um, it's brilliant. It's so good. Um, oh my God, there are so many people. Yeah, yeah, y'all are yeah. here. Then, not unseen but rarer, more modular, more modular, um, shit, more modular classless character building in both meeting, uh, mediums, but more so in tabletop games. A modular classless character building. I think that's actually fairly common, um, but just not with the kind of games that people are talking about if they mention that. Um, they're talking about more like a point-based D&D. Or something like mm. a, you know those kind of things. Fuck okay, it. Why don't we all just go play GURPS? That's fine. It does everything. It does. It's really. It does. <laughs> um, we should play a game of GURPS sometime. We should. On just stream. to like kind of to talk about the, it. I think that. Would be... is a disease. D&D is a disease. Well, that's why we won't play that. <laughs> the only way I'll play D&D is if it's for charity. Mmm. We'll get. Yeah. We'll get to that. All yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, go ahead and just request Liv to play for charity it needs to be a lot of money like it needs to be a lot of money <laughs> like it has to it has to yeah. save lives <laughs> basically like none of this chump there change five hundred dollars shit like a charity for for christmas or something yeah Ooh. um you know speaking of which oh yeah because we're we're cruising up on the hour here i just wanted to mention guys what are we doing what the hell is going on um there's a lot of you here so i just wanted to give you a shout out thank you for coming thank you for joining us um, you've been here for the discourse segment, uh, so we talked about Holy Grails, go, oh, Holy... Holy Grails of Gaming. That's the one. Uh, but, the Grail. The Grail. Oh, the Grail. Um, yeah, John John grabbed up for the gnome link right there, and uh, <laughs> um, Phil pulls out Liv is going to play D&D. Yeah, that's the takeaway from all of this. Yeah, my character's um, name is Denny. <laughs> Um, anyhow, uh, so we are doing our kind of fundraiser holiday extravaganza. Um, you can read more about it at that um, ihunt.fund I hunt forward slash gnome, which is apparently easy for me to say. Uh, but the, the basics are subscribe to our Patreon, subscribe to this channel, um, do a couple of other things, and we're going to do a little fun scratch off game where we give away prizes. Um, John can attest that happened. Phil can attest that's a thing that's being done. Um, and so we would love to have you take part in our gift giving celebration. Some of it's like literal, like we give you games. Some of it's we give you um, money to go buy your own games. Some of it's like we donate to charity in your name. We've got a couple of things. That and kind my of... favorite. Yeah. My favorite is the one where Mina or Liv get to write a mic. R mm. run, m write a what? We lost you. We lost you. Micro. Oh, sorry. Microfiction. Yes. Oh. That's right. That's in there somewhere. Lurking. I forgot that those were in there. Lurking. Oh my god. That, that is the best one. Like, you should <laughs> all be aiming for that one and just, like, do whatever it takes to do. <coughs> <laughs> so, the, oh, the other thing is the gnome. The gnome. Gnome in the home. So, we can't do elf on the shelf jokes because we'll get sued. But, we did put Gnome in the Home in our le latest um, Fates, uh, or, uh, I zine. zine, and it has Gnome in the Home, which is a terrible monster that lurks in your house and stares at your kids and makes your life miserable, 
And we wanted to spread the misery because it's the holiday season. Mm -hmm. So we're encouraging everybody to stop by that site and um, grab, um, grab that gnome and Photoshop or otherwise edit him or it into your family home, your favorite Christmas movie, hashtag it with iHunt and Gnome in the Home, and then we will give you a present on the next stream that you come by. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's that's our 7 o'clock hour, or 6 o'clock, that's our 7 o'clock hour. Yeah, I guess it is. Um. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I already put it on my cover image and my... Uh, my profile picture. The gnome is in your uh, home. Yes. <laughs> I found um, it. <laughs> the gnome is very much my home. Oh, gosh. I do see it. That's neat. Okay. It, it would be great if <clears throat> we all had nightmares about the gnome by the end of the Christmas season. That's the goal. That's the goal. That's the dream. The, the dream is nightmares. Yeah, the dream is nightmares. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, so we're coming up on the hour. I mean, we're a little bit past the hour, which is fine. Whatever. No big deal. Um, this is like seventy five percent. Yeah, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna be shifting over to the uh, other topic of discussion that's gonna be the majority of our time tonight, mm. and which um, we're gonna go over um, how to run bait. Yeah. Um, not like we're not gonna explain the basic rules um, like that. You can just do by fucking reading Fate Condensed um, or Fate Core yeah. or I Hunt specifically. Yeah. Just read I Hunt. <laughs> um, but read on hunt, but keep a copy of Fate Accelerated in your purse. Yeah, or purse condensed. Fate condensed. Yeah. Mm. But so um, we're not going to explain the basic rules, but we are going to tell you how to apply the game right. um, because it's different. It's different than these a books, traditional game. Yeah, and these books are often written focused on the player. Yes, they're not focused on the GM mm. or DM role. Um, for the sake of language, we're going to use director because that's our in-house style. Yes. But we do mean GM. director, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Whatever thing you want to use. Yeah, generally, there's like a um, in a lot of these books and a lot, of, and, and this is gaming wide. Um, there's sort of like a, a GM ghetto. Like there's like a chapter that is that this is the one for you. If the, you're the GM, you get to you get to go in this corner. Right, and, and nobody else can come into that corner. Yes. That's the other fun part. Yeah, it is. It is completely. It's it's walled off. It's tiny, it's not the majority of the game, and it sucks. Like, so we, we consider the GM a player, we consider the director a player, and we want to focus on how to make that role work. Yeah. Um, sunglasses, oh. Trevor, would be really cool. Yes. And it's worth mentioning, mm -hmm. if you do want to learn the basics of how to play this game, honestly, the best place to go is that YouTube video. Which John John, built. Hi, John. Um, John and his team put together <clears throat> and like it's it's the best like 10 minutes less than 10 minutes you can take to learn a game yeah I think that it teaches you everything you need to know to get started on fate yeah um, and in fact the presentation style that John used um, I'm sort of aping a little bit for the um, the upcoming IHOP players guide yeah, um, yeah. Which, actually, I wanted to talk about real quick before we get into that. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, so, if you look at the... Um, actually, does anyone have the iHunt.fun slash gnome site up right now? I think I do. Okay. Can you pull Can you pull it up? Yeah. Can you pull up the tracker? Yep. Okay. We are at $4,881 on our pre-orders. <clears throat> and this is, this is our pre-orders and our itch sales and our direct sales and stuff like that. Um, so, anything applies... Um, we have tote bags. They're twenty bucks. They're on itch. They're really fucking cool. You should get one. But anyway, if we hit five thousand, then we've got a super fucking special thing, um, and that is the iHunt Players Companion, uh, which is a book that I am currently working on. Philomena is working on it as well. It's just it's going real smooth. Oh, it's I'm good. done. My hunt. Oh, you've done your part. Yeah. <laughs> um, I picked the easy part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. But it's um, it's a really cool book. It's a little six by nine book. It's going to be short, like we're talking like sixty pages short. And the idea is is that it's going to teach you everything that you need to know to play I Hunt. Um, it doesn't have like the complicated rules for like how to make monsters, or it doesn't have like a gig generator or anything. It's very bare bones. And the the point of it is is that it's a reference guide that you can hand around at your table. Um, if you have a big copy of the nice big hardback book and you've got six players trying. To to make characters what the fuck are you going to do they have to share if you have the player's companion which is much cheaper 
much easier to, to handle because uh, it's, you know, very, very light. Um, then basically you've got what you need and it halves the time that you have to make characters and stuff like that. So it's, it's a good, good reference guide. Um, I know that for the games that we are going to be playing in the house, I will make for sure that we have 10 copies uh, because <laughs> I want to make for sure everyone has one. Also, they're going to be cheap enough that you could fucking highlight them. Um, and if we hit 5,000, which is like 120 bucks from now, $119 from now, then everyone who pre-orders iHunt will be getting a copy of that. Free. Free. Yeah. Free. So if you go and you order your copy of the physical, the big, gorgeous, gold-plated book, not gold-plated, gold foil, foil stamped, stamped uh, book, then, and everybody works together to get this goal hit, then by God, everybody gets a free copy of this. So now you have automatically two usable copies of the game Correct. on your table. Done. Yeah. You have a beautiful desk reference and you have... A little reference guide. I'm um, just curious. The the player's guide is going to be a little cleaner, let's say? Yes, actually. It is going to be cleaner. Um, the profanity will be minimal. Mm. Um, it, it will be minimal. It's going it, to... Like, I'm not going to say that it, like... I don't like the term family-friendly, but it basically has family-friendly language. Um, it has a little bit of I have attitude in it, but it's not... Like, I there's not a page where I, in bold text, say fuck, but use 17 letters to extend it for longer. Yeah. Um, I do that in the iHunt core book. Um, that's not going to be in the player's companion because the player's companion is going to be like a front facing guide that you can just give someone. Um, and you don't need to like apologize or explain it yeah. with, with the iHunt core book. You gotta be like, this is going to be a little bit of a read. Like this is a, this is a, this is a harsh book. This is not. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you don't have to do that with the player's companion, but you can give this to a teenager and it'll probably be fine. Yeah. Um, the other sort of minor thing about that is if we hit 10,000, 10, then the player's companion is pay what pay you want. want. Mm -hmm. So you can get digital copies um, and you can just give them to your friends, whatever. Like you can just tell them, oh, you want to fucking read iHunt? Whatever. Do it. It's right here. This is how you play iHunt. Yeah. Um, so if we hit 10,000, then that's going to be a pay what you want product. Yeah. Um, all right. Now we're going to fucking teach fate. All right. Are you ready? Is everybody in the chat ready for a very bold statement? Okay, I'm not fucking around with this. I'm going to say something really bold, and I want you to be ready, okay? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's pretend you're ready. Yeah, we're going to assume that you're ready. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Everyone's like, hell right, yeah, right, bring right, it. All right, all right. Here yeah, we go. Fuck yeah. All right, here you go. Three, two, <laughs> one. Okay, Fate is a triple-A game. It's she not, said what she said. I said what I said. It is not your standard tabletop game. It is not D&D. It is not any of these things. It is a triple-A game. Yes. So I want you guys to all remember that going forward as we go through the whole rest of this thing. Fate is a triple A game. Spoiler alert, it's a, mnemo it's a mnemonic. Hey, shh, quiet. Um, <laughs> so I want you to keep in mind three A's. You need three A's, okay? Are you ready for those three A's? This is my first AA meeting. This is your first, okay. Well, you get a That's two A's. You get a chip at the end. Yeah, this is triple oh, A, a so we'll fix your car. Oh, I get a fate point. Yes, you get a fate point. That's right. Oh, my God. Um, we're getting in a weird... How many tell. days sober is our game? Um, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, but triple A games are bad. I know. It's very conflicting. So let me explain what I mean by triple A game. We're reclaiming the term. Yeah. Okay. We're ready. Go ahead. Oh, oh, oh. Boom. All right. So, the three things that you do in a fate game, as the director, your high concept here, okay? Act out, this is what your players are doing. Act out, apply fate rules, add aspects. That's it. As long as you're doing those three things in that order, you are playing a game of fate. Yeah. Now, of course, applying the rules of a game, that makes sense, sure. But the order here is very important, okay? Act out, what does that mean? Do I have a special one for each one of those? Yeah. If I do. Okay, so let's... Ready? Yeah, let's do that. Bam. All right, act out. Act out. This is for your players. This is what you're guiding your players to do. In fate, the rules follow the fiction. So that means I don't stare at my character sheet trying to do the mathematics of the perfect attack. Yeah. I say, I'm going to punch that motherfucker. Yeah. Okay? And the rules... The systems, they follow my action, yeah. my choice as the player. I have decided what I am doing is punching that motherfucker. Yes. Right? 
I am making an action. I am acting. <clears throat> I'm probably doing it a little over the top, knowing me. But that is the first thing that happens. Before you think about rules, before you think about systems, first, tell me, get your players to tell you what they are doing. Then you can follow up with the, the rules. Yes. First, do shit. Do shit. Yeah. So that's... And if, if they don't know how to do that shit, don't sweat it. You can help them figure it out. Yes. Right. Yeah. And this is, um, you know, be bold. Yeah. Play, play, play hard. Play loud. Yeah. And you as the director are playing loud because you want to encourage your players to play loud. Yes. Okay. So no holding back. We are playing out and loud and screaming and <sighs> great. So first A, act, act out. out. Okay. All right. Second A. Apply fate. See the string with the needle, like the old thing? No? Uh, Wait, did we miss one? I don't know. Isn't that the, it's the second one, right? That's the second one. What's the third one? I, did you not do it? I didn't do it. All right. That's fine. Well, we'll do it without the fucking <laughs> we'll slide. We'll have to add it before we put it up. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, conversion rate of sunglass drivers to fate points. One to one, obviously. Apply fate. Okay, so your, your player has told you, I want to punch that motherfucker. Yes. Now, you as the director, guide them through, yeah, quickly, yeah. the process of making that happen with the roles. Yeah. Okay, so as I said here, know what the character wants to do, then apply systems and dice if necessary. Sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just punching a mo the motherfucker is fine. Yeah. No problem. Um, but at the, only after you've established what do they want to do, do you start talking about systems. Okay? Mm -hmm. Generally. Yeah. Okay? Um, so that's it. Apply fate. Yeah. So first you're going to act out, then you're going to apply fate, and then the last one, which I don't have a slide for because I'm a genius, is add aspects. Aspects. And I want to say this because I want to keep it separate because the order of the events of these things is kind of important. Mm -hmm. You don't need to add aspects to buff your roles until you've already fucked up. Yes. Okay. And most importantly, you don't have to justify aspects no. until after. Right. Like, then you start thinking about why. Right. Because that's the whole gag here. We are... So there's three aspects on the table. One of them is the rocky overpass. And one of them is the, the bush that's on fire. And one of them is an oncoming thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just whiffed my role to kill the vampire that I need to kill or a lot of innocent people are going to die. Yes. However, um, I, I might, I've made a bad role, but I'm not, that's not how the fiction should follow. I don't think that that's the story that I want to tell here. Yeah. I could make the decision to let it happen. But for me, I don't feel like this is the place where my character fucks up that badly. So I'm throwing my fate to the wind, in this case my fate points, and I'm tagging the fact that the bush is on fire. And I'm saying, hey, that bush, guess what? It caught the vampire on fire. Yeah. That's an easy one, but I didn't have to justify it beforehand. I justify it afterwards. Because basically, imagine a cat eating your lasagna. No. Imagine... <laughs> He's Garfield. He is Garfield. Imagine a situation where the camera is up close on the character's expression of failure, right? And we see that they've missed and the vampire is still standing and they're going, ha ha ha, you fool. You thought you could defeat me. And the camera pans back slowly. And we see now that the, the bush that was on fire is a lot closer than we thought. Yeah. And that the fire is licking the ground and is slowly moving up that vampire's <clears throat> stupid pleather pants. Yeah. That's fate. Yeah. Okay, that's what you can do with fate. It's that pulling back motion and going, oh, the whole scene, all of the aspects that we put on the table, all of the things that we've built up till now, boom, now they're going to get pulled into the situation. Yeah. When it seems the direst, when it seems the darkest. Because it gives you these beautiful arches and, and dips. Yeah. It's real good. This is important um, for anyone who is used to more traditional games. Yeah. Uh, because in a lot of those games, like you, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the discourse around things that modify dice rolls happens beforehand like you're like mm, i'm gonna make this hit so i'm gonna try to put together this 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 and this and like you spend a lot of time on the front end figuring out how to make the rules work in fate you do the thing then you make the role then you figure out how to make the role work right and if it's worth it to you if because, it's worth because it. you're spending your fate points you're doing lots of other little sacrifices to make that thing happen so you need to encourage your players when and how 
to take the risk <clears throat> and make the effort to make the thing go the way that they want it to. Yeah. And to reward them for deciding that they don't want it to go that way. Yeah. Right? So we'll get we'll get to that when we talk about compels. Okay. So this is very simple, very straightforward. Act out, have your players act out, help them apply the rules, help them apply fate, and then apply aspects or add aspects if it's necessary to make the story, the scene, the way you picture it in your mind. Okay. Okay. Francita, what are the three things? What are the three A's? <laughs> The first one is act out, like yes. just do the stuff. Yeah. Uh, the second one is just like apply fate, just yeah. like apply the rule. Yep. And uh, the third one is just um, if you fuck up, then apply the act. aspects. Yeah. 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 Got it. That's, That's it. it. That's fate. That's... Like don't 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 do it beforehand. Just yes. Like wait if you fuck up. Then you can let's start. If you pulling want, on the things that are important in the scene or in the characters. Yes. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So that's that's your that's that's your primary lesson. That's Fate One Hundred and One, and this is something that I don't think necessarily gets communicated very well um, in discussions about fate. And well, this when is... people run fate for the first time and they get anxious and they get nervous because yeah. it looks so alien. You can break it down to these three things and then it's suddenly not as scary. Yes. We want you to be confident about running fate because it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And it's not that much brain work. No, 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 no. It is a little unintuitive if you're used to a different type of game. Yeah. But if you if you learn that that flow, um, then you've got it. Ian, yes, we will be archiving, I hope. <laughs> yes. We're gonna we gotta do a little polishing on these things, but then we're gonna put we're gonna put them up as maybe a PDF or something. Um, so you can have them. We'll yeah. absolutely do yeah. that. Um, Runaway Muse. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely taking notes. So. Good, good, good. Okay, okay. Muse. Um, Muse mentions that when, when they were running it, that um, they would always try to put the aspects first. Right? Yes. There's this instinct to like justify your character's behavior mm -hmm. um, rather than just playing your character. Fate wants you to just play your character, mm -hmm. and we'll figure out the justification <clears throat> for what they're doing on the back end. Yeah. Do the thing. Do the thing. And then we'll figure out what happened as a result of the thing. I remember when I used to play like World of Darkness a whole bunch and stuff like that. Like I would look at my character sheet. I would look and see what good attribute and skill combo I had. Yeah. And then I would be like, hmm, what merits and flaws do I have to apply? Right. What specialties? Right. What disciplines? Whatever. Yeah. And then eventually I would get around to doing shit. Yeah. We want everybody to look. I want you to min-max so that your character wins the way that you want them to win. Yeah. But I just want you to do it in the right order. <laughs> well, and in, in Fate, you can do it at any time you want. Like, right. it's, you don't have to, you don't have to front load the thing that, like, you don't have to spam and front load. Um, you can probably make anything work in Fate if you want it to hard enough. Right. That's, that's important. Okay, so we're going to, we've talked a little bit about the very basics. This is, this is your thesis statement for the whole rest of the discussion. Yeah. Now I want to break into specifically, if you're moving from a Dungeons and Dragons game, if you're moving from um, something a little bit more traditional, a trad game as you yeah. will, um, how do you learn, uh, how do you unlearn that? How do you unlearn that as a GM and how do you help your players unlearn that? Yes. So. Which is topical because we have people literally talking about that yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. So, so good. Let's do that. Doing? Bam. Trad to fate. Okay. Um, so the first point here, obviously, is the this is a triple A game. So as long as you remember that this is a triple A game, that's going to help you automatically. Did I spell it wrong? And you just forgot an M on the remember. I, I just I was just telling you because you've got it open. So oh, I figured yeah, I you, guess would, I fix you could fix it for the final version. I can. Cool. Um we did this in like an hour. Yeah, we did. That's that's the best way to do these things. <laughs> but okay, so remember seventy five percent. Really? The, <laughs> the okay, so but remember <laughs> that this is a triple A game. Remember right. the triple A. Like, that's going to go do a world of good to help separate you from D&D &D thinking. Yeah. Okay. Every time every time you hit a conflict in fate, like every time like you feel dissonance from what you're used to, yeah. or you start like thinking in like D&D &D or World of Darkness or whatever terms, go back to those tr three A's. Yeah. 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 I think so. There's a lot of good comments. Uh, I loved fate since I played Spirit of the Century. Uh, you had issues primarily in combat. We'll get to that. Yes, we will. Whether we will do it today or we'll, next time or soon. We will do it. Um, 
it's more humane. Sometimes you don't always realize why you're doing what you're doing until after the fact. Yes, and we'll talk about compels with that too. Yes. Uh, I hate to consider 80 different stats. Same. A yeah. goosey goosey game is, you know, more fun as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, it's proof of how good a game is that your character is able to do what they're supposed to do well. Yeah. There is nothing worse than building a character that is like the best at a thing. And the rules just won't let you do it. I am notoriously bad at rolling dice. Like, not that I'm incapable of picking them up and dropping them, but I just roll statistically badly. Yeah. Um, it's a trend that other Same. people have commented on. It's a thing. <laughs> I remember one time whenever we were whenever we were playtesting something for the Chronicles of Darkness, the World of Darkness 2nd Edition. Yeah. Um, we were playtesting something, and I had a role, like, Mina was playing, and she had, I can't remember what stat or whatever it was, but I had her, her pre-generated character was stacked. It had, like... 15 dice to do this thing and there was like a 0.0001% chance that it would fail um, but I wanted to see how well it would succeed and her character is doing this thing and she's like well I'm gonna fail and I was like there's a 0.0001 chance that you will fail don't worry about it I just want to see how it applies Guess what? she rolls and boop yeah so that happens then in Fate, you can come back from that. Right, and that's why I like Fate better. Um, okay, so that's remember this is a triple A game. Moving yes. on to the next step. Jesus takes the wheel, not the director. And this assumes that Jesus is a player. Yeah, well, of course Jesus is a player. Well, I hate the player, not the game. Yeah, right, right. He's everywhere. He's, uh, he's omniscient. <laughs> well, or hate the game, not the player. Hate the game, not the player. Because the player is Jesus. Don't hate, don't, hate the, don't hate your players. This metaphor got out of our hand. It did. I just like the phrase, Jesus, take the wheel. Okay, so what that means, more specifically, um, when, you're, when you're moving from a trap game to running fate, players decide. They decide yes. a lot of shit. Almost everything. Nearly everything. They decide how they get hurt. Mm -hmm. They decide when it's going to be a lasting problem. Mm -hmm. They decide if they live or die. Mm -hmm. Okay. They decide if they're attacking someone. They decide if they're, you know, seducing the goblin king. They decide if they're closing the window. They mm -hmm. make the decisions as to what they're doing. And generally speaking, they do the thing that they're saying they do. Remember, they act out, and that's what they do. Yes. When you pick up the dice, it's to determine how that worked out. But generally speaking, if I say I'm punching the motherfucker, by God, that motherfucker is getting punched. Might not mean much, but I, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. If the dice come back and say, well, maybe you're not, you can still decide to because you have to engage your aspects and stuff like that. Or you could be like, you know, actually, it's not that important. I think I would prefer to not punch it. Like, yeah. I, I prefer to fuck up here. Yeah. And that's okay. But in a traditional game... The GM basically builds the story, and while there is room to sort of explore and push that from one direction to the other, really, the director, the GM, is leading the players along. Mm -hmm. In Fate, the players lead the GM along. Right. The players hold the fiction, and the, sto the game follows the fiction. Yes. Yeah. It, imagine it like a chariot, and the, um, the, the players are horses, and the GM is... The chariot. I, I don't fucking know. I think we're getting into a whole weird pony play this, this, thing. Yeah, this is, a, this is a weird metaphor. Okay, no, the thing is, Jesus is driving. We take our hands off the wheel. We let him drive. And the dice will tell us how well he's doing it. Now. Yes. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> yay, that's right. Um, Jen mentions, like, D&D &D, seems to hate the characters that inspire it. If I had to play Conan in a game, I would only do it in a fate similar, similar to fate game. I would never play, I would never try to play Conan in fucking D&D &D because it would never give me the satisfaction of what I want. I would play Conan in Thirsty Sword Lesbians. There you go. All right. Um, now, Red Sonia, we can talk about that. Yes, the, the slides will be available and the quick start will be, um, it will be available to buy. Hopefully, if we hit 10,000 this, this month, it'll, be pay, what it'll you want. be pay what you want. So you'll be able to get it for free or yeah. get it for a buck or get it for 20 bucks, whatever you want to do. Yes. Um, so, yes, the slides will be available for everybody, and the quick start will be available at the end of the month, probably? Probably, yeah. yeah. I don't. It, basically, it's going to depend a little bit on the fundraiser. Yeah. Um, we'll see, but it'll be either sometime at the end of this month or beginning of next month, probably. Um, okay, so the next point. Um, you roll the dice for what's next, not and then. Correct. Okay, so that breaks down a little bit into... 
Uh, we talked about Jesus takes the wheel. He's the one who is the driving. Okay? Yeah. We are not worrying about whether or not he can drive the car. Yeah, we know he, he can drive the he's car. He's declared that he's driving the car, so he's driving the car. The dice are to tell us if there were challenges to that action that made it more dramatic. Correct. Okay. It's the what next, not the and then. And the and then the kind of cycle that you'll see in some games is like, I swing an axe. Mm -hmm. And then I swing an axe. And then I swing an axe. And like, we get it. You swing a fucking axe. And this replicates throughout the entirety of gameplay. It can be, right. all right, well, I cleared this room and then I'm going to the next room and I'm going to clear it. And like, don't get me wrong. I like me an idle tapper. Yeah. You know, I, I, I play way more Stardew Valley than any human being should. Yeah. Um, but like, that is and then. Yeah. Playing. That's not what next. Yeah. We want what next. Um, and the dice are to tell us what's going to happen next yeah um is this more challenging than the character assumed is it going to is it going to pa is it going to succeed but they have to pay out the nose yeah is it going to succeed but stuff <sighs> goes weird um i don't know if phil's still with us in the chat he knows about going weird um <laughs> jesus drives the drones yeah that's right um so so one of the ways that you help separate this in your mind from a from a traditional game is that the dice are telling us what's next not and that and then, and then, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's that. The last point I have here is start with characters, then circle back around. Yes. Now, what does that mean? That means that the aspects on the character sheet, the stunts on the character sheet, the skills on the character sheet, your players are telling you by putting that character sheet in the way that they have, these are the things I want my character to do. Yeah. So when you're making any decisions about what should happen next, or where you want the story to go, or I don't fucking know. I don't know what scene is next, guys. I have no idea. Look at the character sheets. Go back to the character sheets. Is there a stunt on that sheet? Is there a, a skill on that sheet that tells you, oh, this player really, really wants to do something where they fix um, a robot? Yeah. Well, if that's <clears throat> on the sheet, if they've paid for that, if they've put that on their sheet, then by God, give them the chance to do it. Yes. It, when in doubt, circle back around to that character sheet. You won't regret it. No one at the table will regret it. One of the most common things that I hear from people who play more traditional games is, well, you know, I, I was a little disappointed because my character is good at X, Y, and Z, but that didn't really come up in the Never story. Never came up in the game. Yeah, so like, you know, I, I'm an underwater basket weaver and <laughs> we were on a we we're in a desert. Yeah. Um, so I didn't, I never get a chance to do that or whatever. I'm a ranger, and unfortunately, my specialty is in killing kraken, and we are in a desert campaign where there's never been any water. I have been a ranger in a D&D game where I was a kraken hunter in a in El Qadim, the um, the a Arabic city. I recall. That's why I was calling back yeah. to it. And, um, See, I'm circling back around to her character. And it, it was endlessly <laughs> frustrating. I made it very entertaining, but it was not good in a fight. Yeah, the idea uh, you have to earn shit in a power fantasy is so fucking awful. Jen. It that's is. Right. That's right. So, but the important thing about this is, is that like that happens in those kind of games because the GM, the director, is basically guiding play. Yeah. Um, in Fate, the aspects guide play play right um basically if you don't know what to do next you look at them you you find an aspect and you hammer on it you you build something around that um in fact if you can't look at the characters that are on that table as the director as the gm if you cannot look at characters on that that table and find an aspect that applies to the scene that you're in then you're you're doing a shit job yeah stop it well, and apologize. And, and I guess another way to kind of like do a mental note is you want you want to have somewhere an index card, a digital page where you have a copy of the characters, abbreviated however you like. But you definitely want to have something on there that's like almost like a checklist. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of go through there. Oh shit, uh, Tina's character has a drone. Mm -hmm. I haven't done anything with that drone yet. Yeah. I better put her in a situation where she yeah. has to use that drone. Yeah. That. that... That is something that I, I was going to comment on. Yeah. That um, role playing games are a collaborative yeah. uh, endeavor. Yeah. Like that. Um, so if if like if you ask me my character like what are you going to do and I'm not sure and I I don't know what I can do like I, I am very like like I really don't know what mm. I can do in this situation. Yeah. Then we as a group 
can figure out if someone else can do like create an advantage or something like that yeah. for me to do something yeah yeah because absolutely. it's a collaborative effect like endeavor so we we can do something together it's not always up to me or up to you or up to the director yeah yeah um so one of the comments here um anani nos says i think one of my issues with combat is expecting D, &D back and forth i swing we act and determine what happens the mobs act repeat but fake combat's like it's somewhat more abstract we're horrible at saying this is the goal of what i'm doing and default to well this round i shoot my gun okay so that's the thing there is a um it's a storytelling style yeah. is what it is yeah um and this is um i i keep coming back to this i mentioned it in i hunt so i'm going to bring it up here um but a while ago, there was a really great interview with the creators of South Park. I'm not thrilled with those guys, whatever, but they said very smart thing about storytelling. And they actually stole it from other better writers. And they, they did, but they said it concisely they and in did. a way that I think works very sure. well. Right. And that whenever they're planning scenes for a script for the show, um, everything has to have good connective tissue. And by that, I mean everything has to have because or therefore... Um, between those two scenes. If you go to a scene and you didn't have a strong impetus for that scene to exist in comparison, in relationship to another scene, then it's bad. You right. shouldn't have done it. And in D&D, and in a lot of those typical like games that have like combat rounds, or just combat in general, yeah. um, what you see is, and then, and then, and then, and then. And that's okay for that style of game, but fate isn't trying to tell those type of stories. Right. I think we talked about the holy grail of games and how it's not the same as the um, sort of Correct. longinous. That's the thing. When you are when you are thinking as a G GM or director for fate, you have to remember what is fate good at and deliver that game. Yeah. Don't try to deliver the and then kick down the door, kill the goblins, take the money. Kick down the door, kill the goblins, take the money. You're not going to have any fun with that if you're doing that as a fake game. Yeah. Assuming you could have fun with that at all, which, eh. In fact, for me. like, I've done it and I've had fun with it, but, yeah. like, the thing is, is that, like, it doesn't, fate is not good at that. No. It's not meant to be good at that. No. It doesn't want to be good at that. Yeah. Um, and in a lot of fate games, like, depends on how you're playing the fate game and what fate game it is, but... Some of them prioritize things differently. In I Hunt, if you have a situation like that, if you've gotten to that point where it's okay, and then, and then, and then, this you failed. Like the game, <laughs> the, your hunters are dead. Um, just quite frankly, that's the way it goes. Right. You know, if you're talking about normal people in a gig job fighting Dracula, if it's a back and forth sword to sword to sword to sword, <laughs> you fucked up. Yeah, the hunters, the hunters are dead. Hunters you have are, a bad ending. Yeah, it's not. It's not the way you want it to go. Yeah, it sucks. Um, How would you say for a one shot? Oh, it's great. Yeah, you can absolutely do high hunt as a one shot. Um, the only thing that you do is you just um, you would want to do it with pre generated characters who already have uh, selfies. Selfies, yeah, yeah. They have to have at least one or two. I would say up to like three selfies each. Yeah. Um, so you you definitely want to start with them with selfies. Um, in the Player's Companion, which we are going to be releasing, I've got a five-minute version of the character creation system yeah. that is good for just jumping right in. Yeah. Um, no it's not really much of a system. It's just telling you the bare minimum that you need to do. And who knows? Maybe a stretch goal down the, for this whole thing would be uh, it will also include pre-gens. That's a great idea. We could do something like That's that. That's a great idea. Yeah. I like that. So, yeah. No, you could absolutely do I Hunt as a one-shot. It's, it's really, really well done for that. Um, the other thing that you need to do is ignore the um, the imperil rules. Uh, don't use the imperil rules for the GM, for the director, okay. um, because those are meant to sort of exacerbate the next session. But that's a 200 level class, which is not today. Yeah, so, that's not what we're doing today. So, all right, uh, moving on. Next. Now that you're no longer thinking like a trad director and you remember that this is a AAA game, we can talk about some of the minutia. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about, yeah, let's talk about the specifics of fate um, with the four actions. The four actions. Yeah. Maybe this is what you do. Yeah. These are, in fate, you do four things. It's not very fucking complicated. The first one is create advantage. Create an advantage. Okay. So my question's here. What is this? I feel like this is very What? Cool. What is this? <laughs> that too. But I was thinking like the, the Catholic kind of. Okay, why is Jesus do blah, blah, da, da, da. Oh, sorry, it's a whole thing. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, what is this? So what is create an advantage? Uh, create an advantage is the most important part of fate. 
Yeah. Okay. This is the fun. This is the thing that makes that, fate fun. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's like a big thing that I've, I've encountered, like playing I hunt, mm-hmm. is that um, like creating advantages is so alien for a person that has been only playing D and D and oh like, yeah kind of games. Yeah. Yeah. I guess because that's true. you don't have any kind of power over the game. Yes. Yeah. Except for the things that that your character has in their character sheet. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, the, the struggle so, of like I want to play a ranger and I want to have a pet. I want I want to befriend this raccoon yeah. and have this pet raccoon. Yeah, <laughs> and that's, there's no rule for it. Yeah. yeah. So it just it never happens. Yeah. Um. So basically, in most games, there's no rule for it. It can't happen. In Fate, here's your rule: create an advantage. What this ultimately is is, the player wants to make something happen. And you want to reflect it in the fiction on the table. And what it is, they roll some dice, and if they do a good job, don't worry about the dice. If they do a good job, then they get to make a statement. And this statement is now true. An easy example that I fall back to all the time is, I'm setting the car on fire. Yeah. I make my roll, I have set that car on fire. Now, on a piece of paper, or on your jam board, or wherever you're keeping track of this stuff, some there, somewhere is marked down for all to see cars on fucking fire. Yeah. You don't have to put the F word in every aspect, but you, you might want to. If you're playing I Hunt, do it. If you're playing I Hunt, you do Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, the, um, yeah, this is the cre- creating an advantage is, um, it's, it's interesting in a lot of Fate products... Uh, and including I hunt over comfort comes first and create advantage. I do think the create advantage is the most important thing to express. Yeah. Um, as far as uh, fate goes. And it's worth noting that the other thing that create advantage does, and this is kind of in the rules, but you, you can encourage the GM. One of the things that you want to do is create an advantage can also kind of attack existing advantages and change them. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if car is on fire and you don't want car on fire, um, you can overcome it. That's the next rule. But also you can decide that, like, fire is spreading. Yes. Right? So car on fire plus one. Now we're working somewhere, and I'm using creative advantage to do the same thing. Yes, 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 yes. The um... Cars on fire, crap goes wild. That's right. <laughs> the, the interesting <laughs> thing that I think is that um, creating an advantage, I mean, it creates an aspect. It creates, yeah. it creates a fact about the world. Yeah. And... This is in the player's hand. Yes, it is in the player's hand. It's yeah. in your play- hand as the director too. Right. But it is it is a fact about the world, and it, it is an open invitation to explore. Yeah. And find out what that means to yeah. your world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that is very big. I think. Um, sorry to interrupt, but like, no, no, no. as a person that was like mainly on D and D games, mm-hmm. uh, like being able. To just like add things to the world like by 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 using game mechanics it was like very big to me like i i I took i think i took like a couple of sessions to like get really used to it and like really uh incorporate into my system that i could I could use game mechanics, like I could use fate points mm-hmm. to incorporate anything I wanted into the story. Right. And it would be okay. Yeah. The and other that side of you, it. That, that was like very big to me. Mm-hmm. The, the other side of that is, is that if you, um, because, if you like, play it. Ultimately, yeah. a role playing game is a collaborative endeavor. So, yeah. Like we have to do something together. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and and you can sort of gang up on on those two, which I think is cool. The 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 converse to this though, the the because you're talking about it from the perspective of someone oh, who sorry. no, it's okay, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Very valid. No, like we we've, we've got the time to work through this. Like yeah. that's fine. The the other part of this, the other the the sort of corollary here is that you come from a perspective of playing games like D and D, and then coming to this, and it's a little complicated, but it's also refreshing. If you play Fate and you get used to this, <laughs> you will go back to those games and you will be livid. Um, I recently, well, a couple of yeah. years ago, I played a game of D&D mm. and basically it fell apart because I couldn't use Create Advantage. 
Yeah. I kept trying to. Yeah. But the rules didn't re- like. Th- there's there's a lot you of can't in have those that pet raccoon. No, you, you can't have the pet raccoon. Do. And it was like you know, okay, well, this is um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna set this on fire because I'm gonna um, you know manipulate the environment. And the the GM in the case like looks up the rules and they're like, oh, it does a D6 plus one to everyone in the room. Like, okay, but like. I want to use it as a, a, a distraction. I want to use it to keep people away from me. And they're like, well, yeah, but, you know, it's only a D6 plus one, so they're going to keep coming after you. Like, yeah. fuck that. Yeah. Fuck that. Like, and the, there are a lot of things that they, they just have to go back to, like, the creators of the game to, like, ask them because <laughs> they're really clear on the game. And that is, like, fucked up. Like, yes. it's really fucked up. Like, why do you think it's okay to go to the the creator's Twitter to ask them if this <laughs> spell does, like, if the area of this spell does really apply to, like, uh, open areas. Like, I don't know. Like, it's it's just a fucked up. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, like, I, um, I I really like the create advantage stuff because it's, it's really, it's really a way, like, let everyone know in the table, including the person that is trying to create the advantage, mm-hmm. yeah. that we are doing a thing together. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And uh, it's a game for all of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I am not the god of this table yeah. being like the GM. Yeah. <laughs> that is, I, am, I am so upset about this, per, this perception of the GM meaning an adversarial relationship with the players. I'm mm. so upset by it. It's not true. It's not a, a, a good thing to believe. It's very toxic. It is unhealthy. It's very toxic. I've seen a couple of games that were specifically built for GM versus player, but they were set up in a way that it was all in good fun. Yes. And that was written right on the label. Yeah. And in that case, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that's fun. But that's pretty rare. <laughs> it is extremely rare. Yeah. Okay. Next. But it's not, it's not like okay for like um, GMs to be like, okay, don't read ahead of the book. Yeah. Okay, don't like, don't, don't see what the stat block for this monster is because that's going to ruin my game. Well, that's if the depth that your game, game got. Then that's that's all yeah, you got. If if it ruins your game, if the player looks the reads ahead or looks at the stop block, then your game is crap. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Next yeah. point. When do you do it as a director, Mina? Oh no, we didn't talk about how often it should happen. Oh, how often should it happen? Uh, okay, so I put this question down, and then I realized I didn't have an answer. I keep doing that. We can work through that. Um, and so yeah, here's a little dialectic for you. Um, I feel like you you know think of the, thinking of your game in terms of scenes like a television show or a movie. Um, you can have a lot of um, aspects being created around things that can mm-hmm. kind of fly around a little bit, but you should be aiming towards one strong aspect that will carry forward to the next scene or oncoming scenes. Yes. So you kind of have a couple of layers of. These are quick situational aspects that are here and gone. They affect this role and then they're gone. There's a couple that kind of create the fictional setting and help you um, feel the mood and the environment and Mm -hmm. play with that. Mm -hmm. And then there are a couple of aspects that are like, well, this is what the scene was building to and it is going to cock things up the next time. Yes. In the next scene, whatever we did, whatever it was built towards in the last scene, in the next scene we're starting from, oh shit, on that aspect. Yes. So, you know, making a bunch of little ones as you go, fine, cool. Just remember that they're temporary. And that we'll talk about that more later. But really your goal is to kind of be building towards one really important creative advantage role that mm, creates the movement forward. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I could see that. Yeah. I think as far as that, in, a, in, in very specific terms, how often it should happen is um, just so much that it doesn't get in the way. Yeah. Um, because they can players can spam it. There's nothing to stop them. There, yeah. It, it, at, in a vacuum, there's nothing from keep, keeping players from just being like, I'm going to make thirty advantages, and then on the next roll, I'm going to invoke all thirty of those for plus sixty on my action. It's I destroy the world. Like you can do that. There's nothing stopping you in fate unless the fiction does it. Lana. 
Yeah, Lana will do that. <laughs> um, Lana is my iHunt character. Well, well, I mean, like, running fate for Lana is a whole different discussion that we'll have to have separately. We'll have a whole, we'll, we'll do a whole stream about how to run for me. <laughs> yeah, well, how to run for, for, for Liv, yeah. Yeah, how to run games for Liv. No. That's a good idea. <laughs> um, but, no, you, you want to... Um, or how about we call it a less than ideal player. The less than ideal player. In I the, am a good player. No, you're a great player, but I'm saying, like, there's things well, that we can yeah. talk about. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was talking to someone today, like, about me GMing next Friday's game, mm -hmm. and I was like, I am, I am, I am okay with it. <laughs> I've been told... I'm being told that Liv is going to break any preparation that I do. Yeah. So, like, I, I am making my peace with that. Yeah. yeah, make your peace with that, because Fate is not good with prep. No. Fate doesn't like a lot of prep. No. Um, but, I, so... I am, I am okay with that, actually. Like, good. I, I, I acknowledge that that is a thing, <laughs> but I, I need to prep to be, to feel prepared enough yeah. To uh to run the game, even if that prep doesn't get used on the game. Prep That's for my, you. It's something for my brain. Yes, prep for you. Don't prep for the whole game. Yeah. Like, and we'll talk exactly. a little bit about yeah. what's ideal prep and that sort of thing too. That's in That's here. a good idea. Yeah. I mean, that's in here. So. Oh well, good. Then you had a great idea when you put I, it I in the slide. I prepped for this. Yeah. yeah, you prepped for this. What the fuck? <laughs> okay. okay. So, when does a director do? Good job. <laughs> when does a director create an advantage? Um, honestly, the director shouldn't create an advantage very often. Yeah. The only time that I would say that you should ever do that mm -hmm. is if you're playing an NPC that has a very prominent role in the story, mm -hmm. um, like an antagonist mm -hmm. or a like sort of co-protagonist, which I avoid when I'm playing, but yeah. like you can do it and it can, it can be useful and fun, but like I don't do it very often. Um, I, as a, as a GM, as a director in Fate, I almost never create advantages. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other than like the couple of scene advantages that you might create at the start of a scene. Yeah. Or, you know, kind of your thematic, th overarching mm -hmm. aspects. Those should be on the table. Those are kind of just a part of like setting your scene, setting mm -hmm. your mood. Um, there, you know, if you think of your table as a physical object, but also there's kind of a, a thin layer over the top of it. That's where the fiction lives. And yeah. the players sit above the fiction and they look down at the fiction and they roll dice through the fiction, and the fiction is made up of all of these aspects and all of these character choices and all of these moments weaved into this one singular thing. Um, so you don't want to fuck that up by adding too much of your own influ influence. Unless it's something mm. that, like, let the players do it. If the player sets something on fire, let them call to it. If the player wants there to have been, like, a car crash down the street as a distraction, they can spend a fate point and do that themselves. Yeah. Um, I, so, I think, yes, absolutely, absolutely. I think that if you, as a director, as a GM, if you, as a director, if you are making advantages, um, then you are doing the opposite of what you should be doing as a director. Um, you should be following yeah. the players. You should not be guiding them. Yeah. And when you create an advantage, whenever you build an aspect like that, you're basically telling them, look over here. And yeah. you should never be doing that. Mm -hmm. You should be looking to them. Mm -hmm. And so the best thing that you can do as a director is y when they build advantages, use them. Yes, because there's going to be plenty on the table. If you're doing things right, there's plenty of stuff on the table that you can mess with too. Yes. Okay. All right. So when, when do you suggest a player do it? Okay, um, so we, the player has acted out. The player has told us their, their action. Mm -hmm. When is that a creative advantage action? Well, okay, so um, if they're doing something and we've decided that it's going to be an action, mm -hmm. does do the consequences of this really matter? Mm -hmm. Or will this affect the consequences of a later action? Okay. Um, and like most of the time in Fate, um, you, will, you can finesse the story a little bit and you can finesse the way that the consequences work um and if you sort of err on the side of more things are advantages than not mm -hmm. then look look with that look at look through those glasses mm -hmm. if you do that then you're going to find that probably 75 percent of roles are going to end up looking like create advantage yeah um then because because really 
in a in a game of fate in a story mm -hmm. you should be building towards something yeah and literally create an advantage is literally building towards something it might be the next roll, or it might be the next scene, or it might be a couple of scenes down the road. Yes. If you're creating an advantage that's a gun in Act 1. Yeah. So it's, like, it's very easy. Like, so if... Hmm. Very common adventure story is that the players have to go and they have to figure something out. Mm -hmm. And then what they figure out will lead them toward the conflict that they have to overcome, right? Right. And it looks like... To a traditional game player, mm -hmm. that you get to the scene of the crime mm -hmm. and you have to overcome the scene of the crime, right? You're doing an investigation, right? Right. Like, that's that's a thing that is a very common, like, intuitive thing for gamers. Right. However, in most good games of fate, you don't want to use overcome there. Because you're not overcoming anything. You're building an advantage. Right. You are You are building leads... Yeah. That will help you get to the culprit. Right. Um, so you're, you are creating an advantage. You are not overcoming. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so an equivalent in the game that I ran last Friday night or the Friday before or whatever, um, they, they were investigating us what looked like a serial killer. And I could have decided, okay, well, here's the facts in my head, and they can roll overcome to like kind of reveal them one at a time. Mm -hmm. That's valid for a certain kind of story. I could have done it. But what felt better mm -hmm. was to run the research montage, have the characters making some advantages, and declaring things like, okay, you know the profile of the victims. Yeah. I didn't have to lay out the details of what the profile of the victim was. I just said, here's an aspect that says, you know the profile. Yeah. And then later when it came up again, I could say, oh, you guys already know the profile. Yeah. It's done. So th this person matches the profile. Congrats. Mm -hmm. And it makes it so much easier and so much more straightforward to let them do the heavy lifting. And you just kind of figure out how you're going to seed that and follow through with it later down the road. Yeah. 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 Okay. Totally agree. Um, so if it's, if it's one of those, should it be a create advantage or something else? Probably you want to do create advantage. Yeah. You probably want to create an advantage. Right. It's, it's almost always better to build more aspects. Yeah. Um, that's... Even if you're not going to use them, but we'll get to that later. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this that's create an advantage. That's that's the most important thing. Like that's that's fucking fate one oh one. Create an advantage. Super important. It's unique to fate and it's beautiful. Next <clears throat> overcome. overcome. There's an old spiritual we shall overcome. And... We shall yeah. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah. That is spiritual. That's a fucking protest song. Yes, yeah. those are the same things in my head sometimes. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they come from the same place. This feels like important advice. I'm glad. Good. Thank you. Okay, uh, so overcome. What is this? Overcome is when there's a fucking thing that's in front of you that you want to get through. Um, that you need. To, it's a, there's a barrier. There's an obstacle. Yeah. And it's not another character. Right. And like, if it's another character actively opposing you, that's a whole different thing. That's the other two actions. We'll talk about that in a moment. But overcome is when there's something that's stopping you from doing the thing that you want and you want to do it anyway. You have to overcome that obstacle. I would say, generally speaking, overcoming an obstacle, the obstacle is probably an aspect that's on the table. Yeah, a lot of times a that's going to be times. the case. Not always, but a lot of times. If it's worth rolling. Right. So an example might be... Instead of having the players roll um, to fight 8,000 different shambling dead, yeah, I say that there's an aspect on the table that is crowd of zombies. Yep. Crowd, that's not a fun word. Sorry. Crowd of shambling hungry dead. Hungry dead. Hungry dead. Well, that's what we call them in. Both of them, actually. Oh. Anyway, there's a crowd of hungry dead, and that is an aspect now. It's like a zone. It's like a, it's a problem. Um, you're not going to roll attack to get through this crowd of hungry dead you are going to overcome the existence of this this uh, dead. So that might be stabbing your way through. That might be doing a, um, a Shaun of, of the Dead thing where you mm -hmm. kind of like run around them and then kind of come back and hide in a garbage can or something like that. There's a lot of ways that you could do it because we don't want it to be one thing or another. But the, the idea is that it's probably an aspect on the table and it is, an, it is an obstacle that doesn't have to be a one-on-one -on -one problem. Yeah. Yes. Very much so. Um, no, I like that. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so, Overcome, I think, is... It's the most like a traditional role-playing game dice roll. Yeah. 
Um, in so much as like it's the um, it's conflict resolution, mm -hmm. as we like to call it in traditional games, There's right? Usually a target number that you're trying to roll to hit. Yes. And you, if you get that or better, usually better, I think, um, then you have overcome the problem. Yeah. Um, and that only leaves 98 other problems. Correct. Yeah. Yes, okay. because you have 99. I have yeah. 99. I get it. Man. Yeah. Good, good one. <laughs> Thank you. I like that. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so overcome is, is probably the closest thing to you. You have to standard RPG resolution. Right. If you're really stuck and you don't know what else, what other action that will is, it's probably an overcome. Yeah. So if you're really stuck, you just say, okay, um, you look at the ladder, which we'll get to a little bit later, but it's just your degrees of success from plus, you know, minus four to plus eight or whatever. You pick one of those numbers and say, okay, overcome this number. Yeah. And then we'll figure out what happens. Yes. Um, this is after your character has already acted. Okay? Yeah. Your character has told you what they're going to do. They're going to run full long like a football player through the center of the crowd of zombies, and they're going to go run so fast and so hard that they're getting through with no problems. Yeah. Then I'm not really sure that's not creating an advantage. It's not an attack. Okay, it's an overcome. Um, I think that's going to be a moderate thing, so you got to have to roll better than a plus one. Or a plus one or better. Yeah. And in the... Um... In the um, how often should it happen, I guess it's it's kind of like bleeds into that. Yeah. Um, my personal advice for people running a game of Fate yeah. is if you, um, so, you know, AAA, right? Yeah. Act. Yeah. Apply Fate. Uh, so you're applying Fate mm -hmm. and you're like, all right, this is an overcome action. Mm -hmm. Stop. <laughs> Do a mental test. Yeah. Can I make this anything else? Can this be create advantage? Can this be attack? Can this be defend? Mm -hmm. um, if it can be anything else, Do make it that other thing. Yeah. Overcome is the most boring of the four <laughs> fate actions. It kind of is. Yeah. yeah. It is definitely the weakest link in fate. It's necessary. It is. And there will be times that you'll use it and don't feel bad about using it. But by God's sakes, don't lean on it, please. In a bad fate game, overcome is the most common dice roll. In a good fate game, it's the least common dice roll. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk we about... We should note that down for the Ooh, book. Oh, that's a good one. Um, somebody clip that. Yeah, somebody, yeah, <laughs> somebody, somebody clip and remind me that, because um, that's going to go in the player's guide. Okay. I'm actually going to add it to the slide that I have. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So, and we're going to talk a little bit about attack and how to make that different than it sounds like it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um... Next, actually. Yeah. Okay, good game. Good game, great game. Good game equals great advantage. Boring game equals... Overcome. Okay, I'm taking live notes, look at that. Yeah. I realize Francie is playing and taking notes too, so that was kind of silly. Yeah, but that's an important thing that i got to put in a book, so... Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right. When should you do it as a director? Uh -huh. um, yeah, and you specifically mentions uh, I was worried that I didn't use overcome enough for our game. Nah, don't don't worry about it. Don't if, sweat it. If you manage to do a fate game with no overcomes, in my experience, it's the best type of fate game. Now I'm thinking of my last game session. Did we overcome? The I only think. time, yeah, I don't think so. I don't yeah. know. The only time, the only time I end up usually using overcome is in relationship to the zone rules, which I don't sure. think we're going to talk about today. But we might, but mm, kind of. I mean, that's literally what I described when I talked about getting through a horde of, of shambling dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's moving through a zone, and you, that overcome is what that's for. Yeah. I think zones deserve their own stream too. We can do that. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> Yay, drunk ramen. <laughs> yes, the drunk ramen is good ramen. All right, cool. Um, so don't sweat it. So when should, uh, how often should it happen? We've, we've established How often? That. We've already established yeah. When do you do it as a director? My answer is never. Yeah, no, if, if players have created a problem for an NPC or whatever, um, just let it be a problem. Yes. Um, in fact, you can take it a step further. Don't just let it be a problem. Let it be a compel. Ah, oh, sure, right, because yeah. you can compel your NPCs, too. Please remember that. There's, um, so we're not going to get too far into the way that, that aspects work and, like, compels and invokes right now, but um, there's two things that you can do with an aspect. You can invoke it and you can compel it. Mm -hmm. um, and 
the invoke is basically where you use it as an advantage. The compel is when it becomes a disadvantage. It becomes a hurdle. Yeah. Um, it becomes a hindrance. Yeah. And um, you can just ignore that by spinning a fate point. Yeah. Um, or you can eat it and take a fate point. Yeah. As a director, always take the fate point. Yes. Don't fucking, don't overcome aspects. Yeah. Don't ignore them. Yeah. Don't break them. Don't mm -hmm. get rid of them. Let them be hindrances. Let them get in your way. Mm -hmm. The players made them for a reason, and if you spend a fate point and say, I'm ignoring this, they're going to hate you. <laughs> and they have a good reason to, because yeah. you're a bad person. Well, because you they don't put all that effort in all them bear traps. Yeah. And you just skip through them? That's a dick move. Yeah, well, That's they, not fun. Yeah, they, they did the bear traps. They caught this room on fire to block you, and you're like, okay, well, I'll spend a fate point and get through it. Fuck you. <laughs> don't do that. Don't be that guy. Don't Come do on. that. Come on. And it, some of this, really, if you think about it, is don't grandstand over the players. Mm -hmm. You are a fan of the players. You are their biggest fan. Yep. The characters, I guess. You don't have to be a fan of the players, but maybe you should be. Yeah. Um, so, like, don't grandstand. Don't kind of, like, try to beat them to their own... Never, ever, 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 ever act like you're beating them. No. Yeah, God. No. Fucking damn it. Please don't. No. Laugh. Be excited about how yeah. fucking awesome what they did was. Yeah. And, like, we say these, is, these are, like, always rules. You might have the one NPC that is a long-standing villain. Mm -hmm. And then you do overcome the one time because you want him to be there for the next thing. Yes. The alternative, though, is you can talk to the players. Right. And be like, I would like to have this villain recur later. Can we and, work with that? And them? remember the thing about players saying whether the characters live or die... You can technically do the same thing. That's correct. If your character, if your if your cool ass NPC who needs to be here for a later problem, gets knocked out, knocked out means out of the scene. It doesn't mean dead. Yeah. So you can figure out how they get out of it later. Don't fucking sweat it. But, yeah. Um, adversarial GMs just confuse me. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Like guys, it's, it's not here? good. You know what it comes from? I'll be honest with you. It comes from their board. Yeah. They're not having fun. The game is not set up for them to have fun. They're, they're, it's a servile role. You are doing all the work. It's all of the emotional labor of putting up this whole world that you know the characters are just going to poop on anyway. So you might as well fight them. Yeah. Because at least then you're doing something. Well, and there's this fucking, there's this Protestant goddamned like Calvinist approach to GMing yeah. where like you feel that the only way that the players have done a good job is if they overcome overwhelming adversity. Right. Like fuck that. And like is are you even a good GM if you haven't killed some of the characters? Yeah. Well no. <laughs> Unless you're playing my game found footage, in which case you have failed if you haven't killed most of the characters. But that's a very specific thing and that's that's on the tin. That's on the label. That's what it's expected to be. Liv is grabbing water. Um, yeah, uh, Jen says, I'm going to spend in-game resources to make the game more boring. Never, ever play with this dude. That's correct. Yes, Absolutely. please do not. Please do not. <laughs> or help them. Like, you know, if they're a good friend of yours and you can sit down and make them listen to this two hours monologue, then, you know, that'll help. But, um, so, yeah. So, when do you do it as a director? Never. Basically, uh, when do you suggest it as a play for something the player to do? Uh, my go-to, as far as that goes, is if there's an aspect on the table that they are literally in in that fictional tapestry that I described, sitting on top of your table. If there's an aspect in there that is something in their way, that's when they want to overcome. And if they don't want to overcome, whether expressly or inexpressively, compel it instead. Okay, we'll go into that a little bit more specifically later, but if your care if if the act action, the player says, um, the wall is on fire, I can't. Yeah. Right? That's a compel. Yeah. Even if they initiated it, even if they said it, like I'm not going to have my character go through that fire, that's too scary for me. Nope. That's a compel. That's an aspect on the table that they are they are not overcoming, they are not attacking, they are not trying to manipulate by with created advantage. So give them the fate point. Because yeah. they're doing something that disadvantages their character and is less than heroic, give them the fate point. Yeah, give them the compel. Give, give it if, to them. Give even them. if they don't ask for it, yeah. give it to them. Yeah. Right? Um so here's a um to, to challenge our own dogma. Um there is one good 
time that you should see um, disproportionate numbers of overcomes. Sure. And that is if you are playing a game where the environment is a, the conflict point. If you're not playing a character drama, fate is typically a character drama. Right. But if you're not doing that, if you um, if if you are going at like just purely the environment, mm -hmm. then you can do overcomes. There is an alternative to this um, that we can talk about later. It um, has to do with the fate fractal. Okay. But that's that's it. If 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 your game, if your story is primarily Players versus environment. And by, and by environment, I literally mean environment. I do not mean monsters, other characters, whatever. Just environment. Okay. Surviving. A, a shorthand example of this might be parkour. Parkour, yeah. Yeah, if you want to do a scene where your your cool parkour character is parkouring it up all over the parkour, mm -hmm. um, then, yeah, let them, let them roll a bunch of overcomes. Yeah. You know, make, make sure they have some creative advantage to begin with because they stretched. Yeah. And they chalked up their hands, and they've gone over this course a couple of times. Yeah. And then, overcome, 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 overcome. So here's a, here's another one. Um, Chase scenes, right? Lost in space. Lost in space. Like, you're the only humans in the environment. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. But, again, it was like I was talking about, like, a mystery mm -hmm. where you have to overcome the, the specific clues. Yeah. That's, you have to, like, here's the deal. Make the conscious choice to have overcome be a thing don't default to it because it's Correct. the easy thing. Yeah. The easy thing is created advantage. Overcome, do it on purpose. In, in in sort of in fiction writing terms, it is like you're allowed breaking the rules, yeah. but you have to understand why you are and yeah. you have to do it with intent. Yeah. In my opinion, overcome action should be breaking the rules. Yeah. And so you only do it with intent yeah. and with a full understanding of what you're doing. Yeah, I think so. So I think that's a good close for Overcome. Yeah, I think so. Okay, and if there are going to be questions, try to like jot them down, remember them. We will try to leave some time at the end to yes, answer them. Yes, absolutely. So like, don't don't hesitate to like put them in your mind. You guys are probably earning Trevor's as you're sitting here listening, which is awesome. Um, when it comes to question time, you can always hit that little button and highlight your question so we can find it more easily, okay? Yes, yes, please. Okay, and that's specifically questions for us about all of this. Okay. Yes. By all means, talk. We're going to be reading the chat, but, you know. Yes. All right. Next action. Next action. Attack. Attack. Punch that motherfucker. Attack. Punch that motherfucker. What is this? Attacking is when you are acting against another character mm -hmm. with the intention of causing them stress yeah. or harm. Okay. So I think it's important with fate, because this is a thing that I got tripped up on. Harm is the, the thing that you do. It's the it's the numbers, I guess. It's the yes. I, I roll and I get this 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 many, and you roll and you got that many, and I have more than you, so I'm doing harm to you. Yes. Okay. Harm is is that detail. Yes. Okay. What the player does when they are harmed then is they decide where they put that harm. Is it on this stress track? Is it in this stress track? Do I convert it to a consequence, which is a fancy way of saying a bad aspect, mm -hmm. an ouchy aspect. Um, so, attack. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Are you okay? Oh, okay. I, I, I just I switched my headphones because I think that you weren't able to hear me in my old ones. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, I, we sorry. didn't hear you for a while, uh, so that was definitely the case. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, um, okay. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. Um, I, I have to see what they are, what, what's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. But, like, I was trying to say that, um, it's a very important thing for a for a person that has been only been playing D and D and those kind of games, to uh, just like uh, get into their system that playing a tabletop RPG game is um, is not about just playing what the GM is presenting you, but yes. you are doing a story with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And with the other players. So you are able, if you're playing Fate especially, you are able to um, to just intervene with your own stuff. Mm. Yeah. What you think will make the story better, and I think that is a very that this is a very important thing. Like the most important thing, even when you're playing a tabletop RPG, what is going to make the game better for everyone? Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Um. So that. That, that is my that is my uh, my ad 
to the whole thing. Got yes. It. Thank you. Francida out. <laughs> the um. <laughs> there, so so attacks cause harm. Attacks cause harm. Harm can do one of three things. Yes. Stress. Stress. Consequences. Uh huh. Taking you out. Yes. Oh, there you go. Okay. Basically, the way that the that attacks work, just to in the simplest terms, they cause harm. Yeah. Um, the number of shifts, the number of the the basically the dice roll result that the attack gets over the defense determines the the amount of harm. Yeah. So an attack with three shifts causes three harm. And three shifts is I rolled I, one. The person punching me rolled I have four. A four. I yeah. Have an important point yes. Can my pl- can my character die in a fate game without me wanting it to die? No. no. And I'll explain how that works in just a moment because it's actually really relevant to the attack action. Okay. okay. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to present it out there because it, I think it's a very oh, another common issue in like D and D centric yeah. games. Where, yes. Like, Oh my my character my my player like, like my character died in this game and I didn't want it to but like that's how things went. Yes. And I'm like, no, that's not okay. Yeah. So basically, okay. So harm does one of three things. It does stress. It does consequences. It does taking you out. And essentially, you have the choice mm-hmm. of how to apply that if you are attacked. So for example. This motherfucker punches me. Um, he's done harm to me because he beats my defense roll. His attack roll is bigger. He has done harm to me. Mm-hmm. The first default is I'm taken out. Yes. That's it. I I, there, I don't do anything about the harm. I'm just not cold. This is the um, the uh, the heroine in a fifties um, sci-fi who gets one conk on the head and is and unconscious. Out. Unconscious for the rest of yep. the game. Yep. Or, you know, oh, there's a spider. It scares her. That's an attack. We'll get to that. Um, it frightens her. She faints. She's out for the scene. Yeah. Okay. That's the first thing that happens with, an, with a successful attack roll that mm-hmm. does harm. You're out. You're not dead. You're out. One way or the other, you're not a part of the scene. You're not taking yes. questions. Okay. What's, how do I stop that from happening? You mitigate that by, by taking the harm and applying it to stress right. and or consequences. Right. Um, consequences are lasting trauma mm-hmm. um, that act as an aspect. You have three of them. You have a mild, moderate, and severe. Mm-hmm. And basically, those act as aspects. If you have any, if you if you fill it, it they they are worth two, four, and six harm each, um, respectively. The the mild, moderate, and severe. And if you put any harm into one of those boxes, you fill it. Um, so it's always best to put as much as you can into it if you, um, it, like, you eat up the most you can with it. Um, right. but if but it's if full... Put, like, a four harm, um, a four harm thing into a six harm box. You could. That would not be, like, yeah, but that would not be, like, uh, like, very smart for you to do. Unless but you've you- already taken your four box. And you have nothing left, and you will be taken out if you don't fill that severe box. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. Mm-hmm. Um, but, so you eat any amount of harm into a consequence, and it becomes an aspect. It is a lasting bit of trauma that can be used against you. Um, the more fluid form of harm mitigation is stress. Mm-hmm. Stress is extremely temporary. It refreshes at the end of the scene, and you have a handful of boxes, three, five, or seven, um, as the case may be, and each box is worth one harm. In I Hunt, you have a stress track for discussing physical stress. Yes. And you have a stress track for discuss for mitigating emotional stress. That's right, mental stress. Mental yeah. stress. Um, and as Francita will tell you, uh, you can take a character out by depleting their mental stress. That's right. Um, different games of fate will yeah. Different games of fate will have different stress tracks. Yeah. So. And the thing is, what those are has to inform how you run the game, mm-hmm. right? So if you don't have a game that has a mental stress track, that means that game does not care about your feelings. Or it just couples them. Or puts them together right. or something like that. Yeah. So like in Fate, in, in I Hunt, that's the way we right. do it. A different game will do it differently. Yes. Okay. And I mean, yes. the, yeah, other games will also do consequences differently as well. But like that's, we're, we're meandering on that. 
And the the player chooses. Right? Yeah, the player chooses. That's so the important part. If the player decides, like, okay, the character the character was berating them emotionally and and attacking them emotionally, uh, it's okay to cry. That's right. Um, attacking them emotionally, <laughs> berating them emotionally. Um, but they decide that their response to it is that they've dug their fingernails into their palms. Mm -hmm. So they decide they're going to put it on their physical stress track, not on their their mental stress track. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Make it work. Mm -hmm. Follow, the fiction follows the action, so mm -hmm. you're good. Don't worry that's about right. it. That's right. Yeah. Or the system follows the fiction. The sis yeah, rules follow fiction. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Um, okay. But back to the core of what an attack is. Okay. Attack is an attempt to cause harm. We meandered and explained what harm is. We'll go into more detail about that later or yeah. another time. Or another time. But an attack is an attempt to cause harm. Yeah. The reason why you cause harm is basically twofold. I don't think this is ever spelled out in a fate book, but it's one of two things. Either you want to take the other person out, mm -hmm. or you want to threaten them with the potential of taking them out. Right. Um, the, the possibility always exists that someone will be taken out with a dice roll. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's fate, and because you choose these things, it's not really going to happen by accident. Mm -hmm. um, you you will have to make it happen. But an attack is a statement that I have that pot potential and I I am going to express that potential. Mm -hmm. It is an it is an attack. Mm -hmm. And remember because this is a this is this is a movie, this is a television show. You're thinking it in those terms. Mm -hmm. What does the actor never want to happen? They never want to be put in a coma. No. They never want to be, like, knocked out in the first, the beginning of the scene. They never want to be tied up and spend the whole fucking movie in a basement tied up somewhere. Yeah. So being taken out means they are not getting to be their character, which is what they don't want. Yeah. Unless it's really dramatic and then they get to have fun with it, right? Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so... The... But the, the, the one important thing, and it's, it's, it's one of the... It's a... It's a conceptual weak point with fate mm -hmm. is that an attack, even in the symbol here, is associated with physical violence. Right. That is not always the case. There are other ways to get people out your face. Harm is mental, physical, emotional, reputational. It can be any number of things. Anything that would strip a person to inactivity to a lack of agency if taken to extreme that's harm mm -hmm. so anything that causes harm is an attack um calling someone's mom whatever you call them in the 90s that would be an attack even though you're not punching them yeah the um the kind of the mean girls thing of like standing with your group of friends and saying loud enough for them to hear can you believe she wore that Mm -hmm. And if I roll well enough on my attack action there, maybe she's so embarrassed, she just fucking leaves. Yes. Okay, that's that's a successful attack. She's been taken out. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's it's important to not associate attack with violence. Um, or not only. Well, yes, yes. Attack encompasses violence, but encompasses so many other things. Mm -hmm. uh, that's So attack is not, not the best term. Okay. Um, okay, that's important. How often should it happen? All the fucking time. <laughs> um, basically, it should happen... I, I, I honestly think that attacks should happen more in Fate than most people do with them. Okay. Um, because most things that you are trying to do within interpersonal conflicts are attacks. Even if, even if they seem a little bit light, a little bit gentle... Um, but there is still a struggle. There is still a conflict. You are still causing harm. You are still causing stress. So more things should be attacks than not. And let me tell you why you don't have to sweat doing this as the director. Mm -hmm. Stress goes away. It does. Stress is gone by the end of the scene. So all it impacts is this scene that you're in. Consequences linger, but mm -hmm. consequences shouldn't, you know, they won't happen all the time. Yes. And if they do happen, then that's something significant that's happened. Yeah. So if that girl that I call, I pointed out how poorly she was dressed, um, if that was hard enough that she actually took consequences for that, that is a life-changing experience. That's mm -hmm. the start of her character arc, for all we know. Yeah. Um, so, like, that's the beginning of her redemption arc, right? 
Um, so don't hesitate to cause harm because stress goes away and consequences make characters more interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I take to the, the Witcher, right? Mm-hmm. And how he's actually a disabled character. That's right. Very early on in the stories, you you get that he got hurt so bad that his, shoulder, his sword arm always hurts him. Um, he can't move the way he used to be able to move. He is at a physical disadvantage. That's a that's consequence right. that's sitting on his character sheet. Mm-hmm. That makes him more interesting, CD Projekt. And <laughs> ignoring that, CD Projekt, is doing a disadvantage to how interesting the character is, CD Projekt. Yes. Um, See so, also Triss, yeah. CD Projekt. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ, don't get me started on Triss. We'll talk about The Witcher soon. Yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> we'll do The Witcher Fate. We'll get drink, drunk and just talk about Witcher Fate. Yeah. Dark fantasy fate. Um, that's right. Anyway. Um, so, right. Consequences are good. They make characters more interesting. Stress is okay because it goes away. Yeah. So do it. Don't do hesitate. It. Do it, do it, do it. Even if you want to do, like, stupid stuff. Like, okay, your character had a tweet go viral and everybody is being a dick about it. Yeah. You can have that be an attack. Yeah. Why not? Um, okay. So Twitter that's... Twitter is attacking them. Yeah, do it fucking more. Do yeah. it more. Um... Okay, so next, when when should you do it as a director? Um, all the time. All the fucking time. Right. Yeah. No, there's there's specific times where I think it's particularly useful. Mm. Um, the first one is is um, if there are too many aspects on the table. Yes. With free invokes. Yes. Um, if there's a whole fucking shit ton of aspects with free invokes and you would like to see those whittle down a little bit, mm-hmm. make the players use them. Yep. Um, hit them. And we talked about playing loud. We didn't really say what that was. But yeah. But like... Throw everything at them. Yeah. Yeah. Have ninjas come through um, the windows. Like, have ninjas come through the windows with punch guns. Um, <laughs> punch guns. And they, they, they use punch guns, and then they hit you, and you have to mitigate that with aspects. While they're downvoting your YouTube video. Yeah. While they're downvoting your YouTube video, they are giving you they are giving you shitty Yelp reviews. Yeah. It's it's a nightmare. Like, it's, why is this happening? It what? is awful. Who are these fucking ninjas? Yeah. Um, do that more. Do that more. Um, because and, it'll help to clear the table. And, and fate is heavily pulp. Yeah. Um, and in pulp, like, you know, you don't know what to do. Have um, some guys with a gun burst in and start firing. Have a guy with a gun come through the door. Yep. Yeah. Like, do it. do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Um, so that's, that's a huge fucking deal. Um, the other time you want to do it, honestly, is like um, anytime, anytime there is inaction on the table. Um, anytime you're standing around, like if, if there's an antagonist... Um, and they're like sort of arguing and monologuing and then the players are like, do we do something about this or do we not? Have them attack. Do an attack. And look, that what? monologue, how, 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 how do you, how do you, um, do you know if you do an attack or you cut? Okay, oh, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there in a we'll moment. Yeah, that's, that's an important one. We have a okay, whole slide okay, for this. Okay, 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 okay. okay. No, cutting is important. I'm ahead of myself. You are. You are, but that's, that's okay. Fine. Um, so the thing is, right, that monologue, that villain monologue where they say we're not so different, you and I, or whatever, guess what? That could also be a fucking attack. That's a literal attack. In right. a James Bond film, whenever the villain is saying that shit, that is an attack. Right. They are going for mental stress. They are trying to deplete you of your will to live and your will to fight, and by doing so, they're going. They're trying to take you out. Yeah. They're trying to get you to stop fighting them. Yeah. So, like, don't even do monologues, or do monologues by all means, but, like, tie them to an attack. Yeah. It's okay. Stress your characters out. That makes it more exciting. But, yeah, if the players haven't done an action in a while, answer with an attack. Yeah. Something. Um, yeah. Uh, like, if, if your children are just sitting around and they're not doing anything, hit them. Wait, <laughs> that's bad. That's bad. Don't no, do that. No, no. Make them clean. Make them clean. Which is That's a mental attack. That's right. Um, hey guys, are the dishes done? <laughs> <laughs> you can't do them right now. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, like that's that's what you got to do. If there is inaction on the table, hit them, attack them. <laughs> to couple it from violence, but also think in terms of violence. No, hit them with a dice roll. <laughs> hit them with a dice roll. Hit them yeah. with dice. That's you know, a... I feel like we're going on the down path. Dark path. But no, that's that's it. Those okay. are the two times I think that you should do it as a director. Mm-hmm. When there's too many aspects on the table, you want to deplete them, and whenever nothing's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, when do you suggest a player do it, Mina? When do I suggest a player do yeah, it? Yeah, when do you? Anytime there is a character, a conceptual, not, not a conceptual, but a literal character to whom they are talking or interacting with that is in their way. Yeah. Anytime they are trying to get somebody to do something that they don't want to do, that could be an attack. 
Because what the way that you can frame you can frame an attack action can be simple. You can also use this for like, I don't know how to get this guy to give us the key. Cool. Yeah. Stress him out until he gives right. you the fucking key. Yeah. Intimidate him until he gives you the key. Yeah. Sweet talk him until he likes you enough to give him the key. This is a core component of um uh um what I'm working on for flat pack fix future. Yeah. Um, it's not called attack. I've changed the language there, but it is the idea is that you can get you can also use it to to remove the obstacle that is a person. Yeah. Right? You can get them to do what you want, you can make them to do what you want, or you can at least get them to get out of your way. Mm -hmm. So maybe the guy doesn't give you the key, but he says, you know what, fuck it, and walks away from his, his station so you can figure out a different way to get it. Yeah. Okay? Um, yeah. And there's a sort of, there's a corollary I have to this. <laughs> Jen says, uh, have, you, have you done your homework? Attack. I already did it. Defense. That's correct. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but it is ultimately a way to get the kids to get out of your room. So yeah, it is. That's what it is. Yeah. He's um, over here taking notes. Like I'm gonna. <laughs> there, there, there is a little. There is another angle to this that I will talk about whenever we get into defend. Sure. Um, that is to coax that, but this this is it's a it's a trick more than it is a piece of direct advice on how to do these things. Um, but GM, I suggest GMs hate her for this one cool trick. Um, GMs hate me you know, for cause, everything. Because the, the thing, the, the clickbait kind of thing. Oh, 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 whoa. Doctors hate her because of what she knows. They yeah, know. top 10 anime betrayals with the attack action. Yeah. Don't yeah. That. Um, sure, sure, sure. So, um, but yeah, when I when do I suggest that the player does it? When I, I suggest that a player does it... Um, all the time. I the, the biggest the biggest one is that if there hasn't been an attack action in a scene and there is the potential for one, just fucking do it. Um, usually, an attack action will will have ripples and consequences mm -hmm. uh, beyond just like the stuff that create an advantage will. Yeah. Um, if you if you want to look at it this way, yeah. Um, create an advantage is building. Yeah. Attacking is tearing down. Right. And you have to balance that. You have to you have to sort of go back and forth with that. Einstein Neubaten. Yeah, Einstein Neubaten. Yeah. Um, so, it, and I guess another way to do it, you can get a little conceptual with this too, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, yeah, I can create an advantage to say that I've hacked into the government. Yeah. Or. You can attack the government. I can attack the government with my computer brain. Which makes you good. Which makes me leet. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Um, with, with, with two of us, we can do it in five. Yeah. Um, hackers reference. Okay. So, like, yeah. It, you know, it, it is when you can make it more exciting. Next. So, next. Bam. <laughs> Defend. Defend. What is this? Uh, what is it? Yeah. It's it's the um, it's the opposite of the attack action. It's what you s use to stop attack actions yeah. and actually overcome actions yeah. um, and create advantage actions. Um, any other action you can stop with a defend. Um, okay, let, let, let me, because I'm going to jump to the weird one there. Um, uh, I'm creating the advantage that the car is on fire. Yep. You do not want the car to be on fire. Okay, uh, that means I'm going to try to stop you from putting it on fire. I'm going to... Okay. Um, that, was, right. that was Aquanet. That wasn't a... Aquanet is Oh, a shit. That's, that, I got a really bad roll. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out... Um, okay. Fire extinguisher. <laughs> so so that's happening, right? So we've deserved, we've acted out, we've described what's happening. Yes. I'm trying to do a thing. Liv is trying to stop me from doing a thing. Mm -hmm. She likes that car. We paid a lot of money for it. What am I yeah. doing? Um, how does that look? What, now let's apply fate. How does that look? That looks like um, we are both going to roll. Yeah. Um, you're going to you're going to roll to create an advantage. <laughs> I'm going to roll to defend. <laughs> And instead of having a passive opposition, which is a static number off of the ladder right. that, that the, the director gives to you and says, this is what you've got to do to create an advantage. Right. Instead of using that passive opposition, you use my active opposition. Yes. Defend sets the active opposition for any other action. Okay. Okay. So you can use the ladder or you can use the defend. Yes. And that'll tell you where your target is. Yes. All the time. Any action, any action in fate has one of two oppositions. Any one one of two targets that you have to exceed in order to succeed. Mm -hmm. And those are off the ladder mm -hmm. or someone else's defend action. Right. And I think it's one of those things where is there somebody who can defend against this? Cool. Roll that. Mm -hmm. If there's and you only use the ladder if there's not someone who could be defending against it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So try to find somebody who can be defending against it first, 
And if that falls through, then you do the latter. If you have an argument for it being a defend action instead of a passive opposition, always, always use the defend action because it will always be more interesting. Yeah. And that's how often it should happen. Literally any time there is an, an attack, a create an advantage, or an overcome an obstacle action mm -hmm. that you can argue gets a defend action. Right. So, how often should it happen? Potentially, literally once for every other action in the gameplay. Potentially. Potentially. Okay. Not always, but potentially it could be. Um, in a perfect world, like in a perfect world in a character drama, mm -hmm. it should be, defend action should be 50% of the actions in play. Yeah. That's Perfect. never going to be the case. That's your utopia, and that's only for a character-driven story. Yeah. But... That's your utopia. That is that is your ideal. So try for that. Jen says in the chat, oh, so use someone's really shitty at something and get a lower target number. Yes. That's good, though. Yeah, that is good. Because that means, like, so let's say we're talking about, okay, I'm hacking into this computer system. I could create an advantage or whatever. Um, my target number could be just something you pick off a ladder. Or it could be Ron, who has been hired for IT, but he faked his resume and he absolutely does not know what he's doing. Yeah. And he totally bullshitted his way through all of this. And the system sucks. Yeah. It could be Pinjolette's character in Hackers. Right. You know, he doesn't even know to, to feed it cookies. Right. I, I can't believe that he made his password God. Yeah. Um, so, like, that makes it more interesting. That makes the fiction more interesting. Yes. And I get a split second to make fun of some guy named Ron, which is yeah. always fun. So. And now I, as the GM, get to have a little bit of fun by adding a little bit of flavor. Mm-hmm. So, if you are doing this. Yeah. Um, if, if you if you have someone defend who is not very good at defending and who will ultimately give you a worse result than what you would have picked off of the ladder, then you made the fires bigger. Yay! We like big fires. Yes. That's more drama, more fire. Yes. Okay. When do you do this as a director? Yay! And the answer to when you should do this as a director is literally the same answer. Any chance you get. Any chance you get. Yeah. If you can do a defend action, do a fucking defend action. Yeah. When do you suggest a player do it? same Whatever. fucking thing right and, and like you can extend this too this can be like this can be and you know you'll have stunts that might affect this kind of thing too but like if i've created a magical ward to protect this area mm -hmm. maybe instead of just saying it's a static number from the way that i created it actively defend i actively defend it yep absolutely and that's not taking away from like action because like it's not that's not the way fate works no defend actions are free right so do them yeah. all the time do them um, so here's a trick that I like to do, um, sparingly. 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 Okay. Okay. This is your, your 200 level class. If you are the director and you are, um, and your players are, are engaging actively, they are playing aggressively, but they are not engaging the system. If they are, if they're arguing, if they are threatening, if they are doing things that could potentially be attack actions... But they have not engaged that system. Roll to defend. Put down that roll. Do it. Yeah. And they're going to see those dice and they're going to be like, what the fuck is that? And either they get it or you tell them, I'm defending. What are you doing? Yeah. And you can, yeah, because you can use that to be like, actually, no, you put this guy on the defensive and he is not going to give you the fucking key. Yeah. That's roll right. the defend. Yeah. yeah. Roll the defend to, to goad the players to engage the system. So that is a trick that you can do in Fate that works very well. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen it done where the players did not respond with, oh shit, okay, I'm going to roll, roll to attack. Right, 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 right. So do that. Right. Sparingly. Sparingly. Yeah. Yeah, it's a trick that you don't want to use too often because then they'll grow to expect it and they'll get lazy about it. But they'll hope that you tell them when to attack. Somebody was asking about that one shot. Do it in a one shot. Do it in a one shot, absolutely. Do it, do it in a game where you're teaching people how to play. Yeah. By all means. Yeah. Absolutely. Do it in your first session. That sets a tone. Yeah. But there's a fake trick. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a way that you can make them do that. Dope. Okay. Um, next. Okay. So we've done the four actions. Congrats. Yeah. That's the four that's actions. most of it. Yeah. So now we're going to talk a little bit about aspects, the scary part. Yeah. First off, Fr Francita, what are the four actions? Overcome, attack, defend, and um, oh, well, what's the last one? The important oh one. The and most the, important one. It, it's the most important one. 
Oh no! Oh my See? God, it's work. the C in the fate core glyphs! Create! <laughs> Create an adventure! There, there you, you go! go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So overcome, mm -hmm. attack, defense, and create an advantage. Correct. In opposite order of importance. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, create an advantage, defend, attack, overcome. Yeah, yes. That's it. That's the order. That's yes, it. Yes, that's right. All right. Next slide. Yay. I'm ready for next Friday. <laughs> yeah. Fuck yeah. Okay. Managing <laughs> aspects. Okay. This seems like the hard part. It is not, but it certainly seems like that. And if you're intimidated at first, it's okay. Grab your towel. Don't panic. That's right. Okay. You made a Hitchhiker's Guide reference. I sure did. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's okay. So we're starting at the first point here. It is okay to have more aspects than you use in a scene. That's right. It's okay if not everything is the smoking gun. Everything that's put down on the table, everything that's created as an aspect that doesn't get tagged, that's a red herring. That's a part of storytelling. You're fine. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, next. And remember the thing that you can do to get rid of extra ones? Overcome them. Attack. No, oh, attack, attack them. Action. Right. Yeah. Attack can absorb a lot of those extra scene actions, uh, aspects. So that's a tool that you can use. And it's kind of cool because then the players will be forced to engage that part of the scene. Yeah. And then, then they are engaging context, and right. that's good. Okay. All right. Dope. Okay. Next. Know which aspects are character, scene, or situational, and when they should vanish. When that's they should right. go away. Okay. Um, in short order, character aspects are things that are on the character. They are who the character is. These are the things that you circle back around to every time. Mm -hmm. These are your, your drama, your high concept, your um, relationship aspect yeah and your consequences yeah okay so these are things that make your character who they are are they old have they gotten a bad arm that makes them interesting cd project yeah um and so those are core to who the characters are and these are the things that you come back to again and yes again. yes okay scene these are creating that tapestry of fiction on the table in front of you. Mm -hmm. These are telling you that there's a red wind sleeping in from the Santa Anas. Yeah. Um, this is the this is the stuff that tells you that the car over there is on fire. Nice job with that, guys. Yeah. Um, these are things that you set to set the scene. This is your imagine you're making a, a stage show. Yeah. This is your painted green tree. Yeah. They only apply here. Yeah. They're in this scene. And unless the next scene is happening in the same place, which would be weird, they're gone when the scene is gone. Yeah. Okay. The other scene is situation, or the other aspect is situational. That is the little stuff that is temporarily going to interfere with things. Yeah, we okay. don't expect these to last at all. No. They're probably going to last exactly one action. Mm -hmm. These are your boosts, both like the literal concept in the game of a boost, but also oh, hey, I'm going to do X, and that's going to make Francita's character better at punching that guy. Yeah. <coughs> They're kind of one and done. Yeah, we don't really expect them to be engaged on a long term at all. Right. So character aspects, they linger. Scene aspects, they are here. Uh, this would also include, like, storytelling aspects that might be thematic to yeah. the story. Um, they're, they're always going to be kind of floating around, but they're only important scene to scene. Yeah. And situational aspects, which are one and done. There. Look at them in perspective of, um, in in the order that they're here, these are the, the amount of permanency that we expect from them. Yeah, absolutely. Character are, are probably going to be relatively permanent, or at least pretty static. Um, scene aspects, <laughs> um, they are not going to always influence the game, but they are going to influence the game far more than situational aspects. Yes, I imagine, Jen, that our cats are trying to communicate with other people's cats who are listening to the stream. So Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> yeah. They're running their own fake game. That's right. That's right. Um, okay, so you set your limits. Aspects don't last forever unless there's a reason that they should. Yeah. So unless there's a reason, it's a character aspect, there's a rule, like sometimes stunts make aspects stick around longer. There's a couple of rule situations where aspects last longer, but in general, they are there to set up something else. It might be the next <coughs> action. <coughs> Bless you. Sorry. It might be, it's okay. It might be the next scene, it might be the next character beat, but they're there to set something up, and once they have done that job, goodbye. Yeah, get rid of it. Get, get rid, rid of, of it. it. 
and if they're sitting around too long, attack. Yeah. <laughs> um, Go for the throat. Yeah, and and some like this is this is where this is where the rules follow the fiction. Right. Um, if I establish an advantage to say that Lana has a baseball bat mm -hmm. um, and she puts a nail through it, yeah, um, I can keep that. Uh, like, I can hold on to that baseball bat, even though it's a situational aspect. I can hold on to it for, you know, a game session or two if I really want to. Yeah. And that's okay, because the rules follow the fiction. But if if it's only relevant in the moment, then get the fuck rid of it when it's over. Like, mm -hmm. don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Don't don't let aspects overstay their welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They okay. have an idea of how long they're supposed to stick around, and then when they're, they're done, they're done. Yeah, do not be afraid to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, overcoming a particularly nasty aspect can be the core of a scene. And if you're doing it analog, ripping up an aspect that has been overcome is very satisfying. Yeah, anything you can do to make fate more tactile is good. Yeah. Use index cards. If you are playing in person, someday. Yeah, someday. Someday in Jerusalem. Um, someday when we can all get together and physically be around each other once again, and we are playing physical fate... Use your ass. Use whiteboards. Use whatever. Make it tactile because that makes the the fiction that sits on top of it more satisfying. Yeah, I love ripping up um, index cards. I love it. Yeah, and you can set up a scene that way too. You can set up a scene with like, here's the big bad, and it's represented as an aspect, and I cannot wait for you guys to get to the point where one of you gets to tear that shit in half. Yes. Okay, that okay. can be very dramatic. Do it. All right. All right. Um, any character can tag an aspect, even the ones that you run. You want to keep this to a minimum, because yeah. you don't want a grandstand, but if characters have foolishly set that car on fire, and I am playing a particularly clever NPC, there's no reason why I can't make that a problem for them, too. And FYI, tag is not a term that we use anymore. That's a fake no. 2.0 yeah, word. Sorry, that's, it's okay. It's okay. I like it. I'm going to keep using it. But no, it's not officially invoked. I like it because it applies to both invokes and compels. Um, but it's just one that kind of got, like, it got, um, what do you call it? Um, obsolete. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it sort of faded away. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of jargon, and we don't want more jargon than we need. Yeah. But um, anyone can do it. Yeah. And Jerome says, I've tried to make sure that I'm not being precious with my aspects. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, yes, engage aspects. Everyone should try, try it. Anyone can tag them, even the characters that you run. By all means, director characters should be invoking and compelling whenever the fuck possible. If, if it's on the table and the characters are not sure what to do, the players are not sure what to do, gesture grandly towards the aspects. Say, hey, are any of these things that you can use? Yeah. And don't be precious with your fate points. That goes along with this, too. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so speaking of which, compel characters with these aspects. Do it. We talked about with the overcome. Like, if they're not going to try to overcome the problem, mm -hmm. then by all means compel them to do it. Yes. Um, go ahead. It is functionally the opposite of the adversarial GM relationship in a game like D&D. Yeah. Um, because you are give, a compel is a negative. It's an obstacle. It's a barrier. It's a thing to, to overcome. Um, it's a hindrance. But when you put that in front of them, they're taking a fate point. You are giving them a toy. Yes. Uh, both in the drama and in the mechanics. Right. We know fiction works this way. We know that the patterns of fiction, it's beaten into all of our heads unconsciously, that your character has bad things happen to them so that they get stronger, and then they win. Yep. And that's the fate point economy in a nutshell. Yeah. And in order to feed that economy, you have to compel the characters. Yes. Do this more than you think that you should. Yes. Move fate points. Yes. Move fate points. Can I, can, I, can I bring a fate point into play by compelling something? If the answer is yes, fucking do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, last thing on this page. Uh, clean things up between scenes. Tidy up. Tidy up. Get, yeah. get, get rid of old shit so that it's not sitting in your way. Um, it'll clutter your brain. It'll clutter everybody's brains. Because they'll just be looking at this pile of index cards or what have you. And going like, I don't know which ones still apply. I'm guilty of this. The last game I ran, I just kind of left everything on the board and I kind of forgot to clean up things between scenes. Don't do what I do. Do what I say. Can I Can I, Can I? I be touchy-feely and, and dorky about this here for a second? If you must. Marie Kondo it. Yeah, that's right. Um, whenever you get rid of an aspect, like you want to get rid of as many as you can. Yeah. But when you do so, thank them. Mm. Acknowledge them. Um, if you're going to erase an aspect, if you're going to get rid of it because it's no longer um, no longer meaningful, 
try to find a way that you can you can honor it. Mm-hmm. And that can be narratively too, you mm-hmm. know, because like so, Lana created an aspect where there was a broken um, parking meter. Parking meter, and she didn't get to use it. It didn't come up. I was very sad. I know. So in another game session, run into a situation where that same broken thing is just sitting there. Yeah. You know, if it was if it was fun that it was made and then never came up because that happens with fate, you know, do a callback. That's fun. The the beautiful thing about aspects and fate is identical to what makes an Edgar Wright movie brilliant. Okay. If you look at Hot Fuzz, if you look at Shaun of the Dead, mm-hmm. um, if you look at Baby Driver. Look at their scripts and watch for the callbacks. Every little fucking thing in those movies comes back later. Yeah. And it honors that past element. Right. So please, if it was an aspect, especially if it's one that you didn't really play around with or whatever, take it and think about it. And if you can bring it back later, that will that will feel impactful and, and it will feel... You will build gravity in your story. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Okay. All right. So we got 15 minutes left. We got four slides. One of which All is right. just kind of a header. So we're gonna try to steamroll through these as quick as possible. You ready? Yeah. Bam, motherfuckers. Okay. Directing the eye hunt way. Everything that we talked about before. This is true for all fate games. Now we are telling you what is from the core of us. Okay. Cut the scenes before you have to. Think like a movie director and cinematographer. Use their sheets frequently. And then the fate fractal, which I don't even know what that is, so that'll be fine. I'll fucking explain it. That's fine. Bam. Cut. Okay, cut. There are no Minnesota goodbyes in a good game of fate. Yes. Do not linger on this shit. Do not hang around and let a scene kind of fade away. The the thing that um, I think that is is very, very common in RPGs... I've, I've seen this since I was a child and I still see it to this day is like the scene is going on and it's lingering and it's lingering and the GM's like, okay, what do you need next? Fuck you. <laughs> I, no, cut that damn scene. Stop it. Right. If, if you have to ask, what do you do next? That means the action is ground to a halt okay. and the scene sucks. And players, you know, are naturally creative. Usually they want to fill the air. We all want to fill the air. So they will just keep doing little things to keep things going because they think that's what they're supposed to do performatively yeah save them that struggle yeah as soon as the like as soon as you have the aspect that sets up the next scene cut yeah yeah once you've done the thing that tells us what the next scene needs to be you know check with the players if there's any other little small stuff that's really important to them before or you can talk about in the kind of segue between scenes Mm -hmm. You can be like, oh, by the way, my character stopped by so-and-so and did X. Yeah. Um, fine. Cool. But cut, by God's sake, cut. Aggressively. Make it, make it fast. Yes. If you can cut, do it. Yeah. Um, like, sometimes, and this is a weird one that players don't get used to instantly. Um, it usually takes a little bit of training. But sometimes you can cut mid-dialogue. Like, you, if you're in the middle of, like, villain dialogue, like, if you're doing... If you're doing that monologue, mm-hmm. you can just cut. Yeah. You don't let them respond. Right. They don't have to. Think of the soap opera scene. Think of the soap opera cut, right? Think of the think of the um the somebody says something dramatic, there's a music sting, commercial break. Yep, that's it. And it closes up on somebody making an expression that suggests that they're thinking about whether their oven is on, cut. Yeah. Good fake games is good TV. Yes. Period. Yes. Okay, next no, point. No walk and talk scenes. Next point. No walk and talks. Fuck Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> okay, shoot your shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shoot your shot. Okay, so this is actually really super topical to what I just fucking said. Mm-hmm. Um, frames things the way that you see them on TV. Yes. If you are running the I Hunt way, can s- imagine everything through the lens of a camera. Imagine it on the screen of a television. Yeah. This is super important. Yeah. When you describe a scene, mm-hmm. consider the composition and framing. Mm. Consider the things that the audience would see. Because they don't see the whole room. Right. And not, not a blank white room either, right? They see a couple of relevant details and they see the characters. Right. They see the action. And you can focus on that and, and give them enough to know where they are. Yeah. You don't need to go further than that. And right. in fact, you shouldn't. Right. That's why every scene should have one, two, or three aspects, scene aspects, 
and that's it. Mm-hmm. The re- don't including any thematic ones. Yeah. yeah, and in fact, this is important because one of the things that players can do in Fate is they can create scene elements. Right. And if you define too much about the scene, aside from those one, two, or three scene aspects, then you put them in a corner and they can't really do much with that. Right. Um, because they're not allowed contradicting you. Right. So don't. Don't right. give them too much. Let them build it. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. And remember, this is this is probably language that your players are familiar with. Assuming that you are not playing with somebody who's been in a time capsule and has never seen a TV show... If you tell them, hey, okay, the scene, the camera kind of closes in on the two of you while you're discussing this. Yes. And the discussion is actually an attack action. Mm -hmm. I tell you guys on close up on the character's face, you know what I mean. Yes. You can picture this. If I say, and she walks into the room and there's kind of a soft focus on her, you know she's got that pretty lady in a Star Trek episode vibe. Yes. And you already know how you're supposed to be imagining this in your mind. Use this language as shortcuts to make evocative moments and evocative scenes mm-hmm. that are quick, logical, and universally understood. And if you use the universe, if you use the words "the camera shows you," yeah, it's mind control. The players will instantly jive with that. Like they will click, they will work with it, and they will give you beautiful things. And this is a really, really great way to draw characters' attentions, players' attentions back to something that you think they missed. Yeah. Right? I think I did that with our game session last Friday where it was kind of like, okay, the camera pulls away and it closes in on um, this guy standing against the wall with his yellow eyes. Yeah. Like, not that anybody was ignoring him, but like, I just wanted to make sure everybody remembered that he was there and it brought it back to an aspect related to that. Yeah. Um, So that, me describing that camera movement you know, and if look, if you're with a bunch of theater kids, use theater language instead. Yeah. But TV, we can't get away from it. So. Yeah. So, use it. Okay. Next point on this yeah. depth. 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 This is important. Um, and it's the camera thing still. Um, the, whenever you're looking at a, a TV uh, scene, mm-hmm. where the camera sits and how much it shows is super important. Right. And it can butcher your scene. Mm-hmm. Or it can emphasize your scene. Mm-hmm. If you're in a diner, mm-hmm. there's like multiple ways you can describe it. You can focus on the two people at the booth having that conversation. Mm-hmm. You can pan out to where you can see the dining room. Um, you can pan out to where you can see the dining room and the kitchen staff working. Mm-hmm. You can also pan out to where you're outside of the diner and you're looking in. Yeah. Those are all those are four layers of depths on that scene. Mm-hmm. And each one says something completely different about what is important here. Right. Do yeah. it. Yeah, imagine this the difference between a shot that's close up on a pair of characters and they're talking and it follows uh, a waitress back and forth to the booth, but we never the camera doesn't move up or down. So we only ever see like her shoulders down as she's carrying the food. Yep. That tells us something about the events that are taking place. It tells us that we're thinking about the food, we're thinking about the people talking, we're not worried about the help. Mm -hmm. That says something. Yeah. Right? And you can expand that in lots of different ways, but... You know, and this is another, like, you go watch an Edgar Wright movie. I was just going to say, yeah. watch Baby Driver. Watch Baby Driver. That's a really great example. Literally every scene that takes place in a diner, yeah. pay attention I to mean, it. Yes, of course. Half the cast is canceled. I know. It's still yeah. a good flick. Um, um, yes. So, so do that. Contrast. Contrast. Contrast is a complicated one. I could talk about it for two hours by itself. Yeah. But the idea here, to keep it short, is... Show things that contrast other things yeah. in order to emphasize those things. In literary terms, what we call juxtaposition. Right? Yeah, juxtapose things and and make for sure if if you are if you are presenting something colorful, put it on a black and white background. If you are presenting something big, put it in, around a whole bunch of small things. If you want to make something impactful and important, you have to provide context. For it, right. Um, I think I did this very literally with my last game session where I had Phil had a bad role. He chose something weird to happen, and I decided something the weird that happened was that he started seeing the world in black and white. Mm -hmm. And then when I wanted something to be important to him, when I wanted to draw his attention to something, I noticed, oh, you can see the color of the guy's eyes. Yeah. Oh, you can see the color of the woman's coat. I mean, like that's you know. The example that um, in I Hunt is um, in there's an episode, an old episode of Beavis and Butthead. 
Where, <laughs> where... Bet you didn't sign up for that, guys. <laughs> where Butthead slaps Beavis over and over and over. Yes. And he's like screaming, ow, 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 ow. And then eventually Butthead stops. Yeah. And then Beavis looks at him and he says, do it again. And he's like, what the fuck? And he's like, do it again. Um, and he's like, but, you know, th that sucks, right? Getting slapped sucks. And then Beavis says, yeah, but then when you stop, it's kind of awesome. Right. And that's contrast. Right. Um, if you aren't, if, if, if someone can take for granted the fact that they aren't currently being slapped, then it's not really impactful. But if you have slapped them and you stop slapping them, then it's awesome. That's a point of contrast. We're about to get canceled. Cool. Um, I feel, yeah, I feel like this one's like in a very different direction. <laughs> but it makes sense, right? Yeah. It's a little risque, Blue. I think so. Yeah. That's that's my trick. That's right. Okay, last thing. On and off screen, real quick. <laughs> On and off screen. Okay, it's so. Fine. It's fine. It's uh, with when pretend. So, <laughs> on and off screen. Most things are going to follow the players. Um, most things are going to follow the things that they're doing and where they are. You, your camera is going to be on them. Sometimes, sometimes. It's a, actually, I guess it should be off stage. But um, basic, sometimes you, you as the director can show things that are not on screen. They're not around the players. Um, Apocalypse World described this best by saying, literally describe off-scene badness. Yeah. Tell, let people know, oh, meanwhile, back at the ranch. Yeah, as long as you keep it short, yeah. you can do villain monologues that the players don't get to see. Why not? Because you, because awesome. And uh, if they can if they can find a way to reference it and something going forward, brilliant. Yeah. Beautiful. Very good. And this is this does that, that dramatic irony. Um, this builds dramatic irony Which because the players know what's going on, but the characters don't. Yeah. And that makes it interesting. Yeah. Like, that means that the players are, are challenged to portray their characters accordingly. And they can also uncover that. They can unravel it. They, they it's, it's a goal. You put a, a, a target for them to hit. Right. And for you, for you who are used to a D&D &D mindset, who are afraid, will want the characters cheat without a character knowledge... Compel them if you're worried about it. Yeah, and also who gives a shit? Right, like really, it doesn't matter. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, we don't care. Everybody watches a TV show where a character inexplicably knows something that's convenient for the plot. It happens. Yeah, and in in fate, it's very easy to just say, okay, well, the characters are awesome. They figured it out. Yeah, who, who gives cares? a shit? Who gives a shit? All right, moving on. Last one. Peep them sheets. No, second. Oh one. no, it's no. like the last one. Shit. Okay, peep them sheets. Okay, uh, we've talked about this. Before. We've already talked about this. Circle back around. Always yeah. go back. If there's a stunt on a character sheet that you've never used before, use it. As a director, if you hit a fork in the road and you don't know which way to go because you're like, I could go either way. Look at their character sheets. Whichever way the character sheet tells you to go, go that fucking way. Yeah. Period. Let Always. The, let the characters do the thing that they put on their sheet because that's what they want to do. Okay. All right. Last La one. Last thing. The fake fractal. Um, you don't know what it is. Okay, so yeah, I'll explain yeah, what it is. No fucking idea. Okay, the Fate Fractal is a really fucking important role, um, or role, a di rule in Fate. Yeah. And basically the Fate Fractal says mm. that anything that you want can be a character. And this is important. Mm -hmm. Scenes can be characters. Ah, I see. Zones can be characters. Yeah. Fucking walls can be characters. Anything that you want to give game traits, that you want to give skills, that you want to give stunts, that you want to give aspects, that you want to give stress and consequences, do it. Yeah. Um, the, the, the wide example of this is in the descriptions of the old TV show Law & Order. Mm -hmm. It was often presented that New York City itself was the unnamed character in the show. Yes. And you couldn't have the show without acknowledging what New York meant yes. to the story. Yeah. And what is the unique um, New York effect? Yeah. Feeling, vibe, whatever. Um, so that's the, the, mac the, the macro vibe of yeah. it. The, the micro of this is um, your car. Yeah. We did a whole thing for this in the On the Roads supplement for, mm -hmm. for iHunt. Um, but basically what we broke down was have your car be a character. Yeah. With its own flaws and weaknesses and aspects and stress. And why not? Yeah. If you want it to matter, make it a character. Yeah, make it a character. You can absolutely use skill stunts, all those things. If it doesn't matter, it's an aspect. Yeah. That's, it's that simple. Yeah. If it's something you just want to be one and done, it, it, 
It could be an aspect. Yep. If it's not, if it's more than that to you, if you wanted to take an active role, it is a character. And this this can be extrapolated to every possible extent. Mm -hmm. So that that brick wall that the characters are trying to get through, I think that it's pretty cool. I just I went to all the trouble to describe all of the graffiti on it. Like I gave it a little bit of history. I told you about the architecture and when it came from. Yeah. I, it's a character. And because it's a character, it can attack you. Yeah. So, I mean, of course, the, graffiti. the wall can't punch you, but the wall can stress you the fuck out when you can't get through it. So now you know how to run the yellow wallpaper for fate. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Anything can be a character. Make it a fucking character. And, and here, we'll, we'll take this a step further. If you have an aspect that is showing up over and over again, if you have an aspect that, like, you've referred to more than once... Maybe it's a character instead. I yeah. know Phil's character is currently working on the down payment of a car. Yeah. That car might end up being an aspect. Yeah. Um, Francita's family um, uh, big big Girl Scout van could end up being a character. Yeah, there's a lot of things that, um, that you can use. That cool weapon that the character keeps kind of like leaning back mm -hmm. on, if it's not a stunt, it might end up being a character. Yeah. Why not? Right. Yeah. 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 Then you can do a lot of fun stuff as long as you acknowledge like... One and done stuff. That's an aspect. Characters are almost everything else. So. So that's it. That's 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 the fate fractal, and this is this is so this is um running fate one hundred and one. Like this is the very basics of fate. Um, and by basics, I mean we think we went to some advanced concepts. Yeah. Um, but that that's fate. And we are literally at the nine o'clock hour, so that was pretty impressive. I think yeah, the timing was perfect. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, everyone, how did that go? Like, did that was that informative? Was that helpful? Do you feel more confident in running fate now? Um, like, because you all have to. Yes, everyone in the chat now has to run fate for me personally. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Not live. That's the two hundred level class. But for me. Yeah, I'm. 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 Yeah. <laughs> and we will make all of these slides available soon once I add in the full one, um, and we fix them up a little bit based on what we talked about. Yeah, Jen feels more confident. Good, good, good. Um, yes. And Nani, I see you. You were talking. We were talking about um, the cutaways to the villain, or whatever. Um, and you were saying that you tried that, and the players got confused and tried to attack them. Um, some of that is framing. Some of them is like literally using the language of TV or movies to tell yeah. them. This guy, you know, tell him he's in the warehouse across the way. You don't know this, but. Yeah. He says this. Well, right. we fade this scene, and then the camera is going to close in on the security room. Yeah. Like, we, this, you are not there. Like, this is what we see, and it's just that. Yeah. Um, use the language of TV. Big... I'm sorry, what was that, Francita? Right. Uh, that is another big thing, like, like, just, like, highlighting some things that are not in the player's like the scene, mm -hmm. but, they, uh, but it's something that, 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 that the air quotes TV show would show. Yeah. Um, and another thing is, um, like, don't, like, I know that I've been afraid to uh, intervene in the, the story that the GM has planned. Yeah, fuck that. Or something. Yeah, fuck that. Yeah. Fuck that, really. Yeah. Uh, just, like, be aware that whatever you do, just be mindful that it that it is uh, entertaining for the people at the table. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And Absolutely. That, is, that is all that is important there. Mm. Like, yeah. if, it, it's, if, if you think it's going to be entertaining for everyone in the table or, like, mm, mostly entertaining for for everyone then do it yeah like yeah go because ahead. you're the actors of the show but you're also the audience of the show you're also the fandom of the show of course right? yeah yeah that is the thing that, that is very important yeah uh and like I feel like for a lot of people that come from a, a D and D background, they feel like they are playing the game that the GM is presenting them. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and that is not true. We are playing a game that we are making together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have to 
we we at the beginning of the game we have to be uh, very mindful of using any kind of consent or safety tools that we can find like the level sheet from i hunt are very good because they are able to just like tell us what we're going to find and what we are not going to find in our game mm. and we have to discuss okay do we want this do we not want this and that way we can have the game that we all want to have like that that is the most important thing that we all have are having fun yes so, to, to close out, everyone, um, we um, pre-order the iHunt book, please. Go fucking do it. I, I, we want to give everybody the player's guide. Yeah, we really want to get everyone the player's guide. We're so fucking close to that level. I would love to wake up in the morning at that level so we can just give away books. And if you subscribe to our Patreon, if you subscribe to this channel, if you make a gnome in the home, we'll give you presents next week. We didn't do any today, or Wednesday. We didn't do any today because we didn't have any new ones to unwrap, but, you know. Yeah, but yeah, if you do if you do something worth a present, let us know. We will do that on Wednesday. And we will be here Wednesday. We will be talking. Do we have a guest on Wednesday? Yes, uh, actually, Jerome. Jerome? Yeah. Oh, who is in the chat right now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So, all right, everyone. Um, it was really fun. I think that this was a really nice stream. I had a lot yeah. of fun talking about game ideas. I feel stuff. better about GMing fate. Good, good. <laughs> I hope that I hope that everyone enjoyed it. I don't know yeah. what the chat says, but yeah, hopefully. It's it you. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well then everyone, have a good night. And we'll see you on Wednesday, hopefully. Yeah. Go pre order I hunt. Yeah. All right. And get get your tote bags. And get tote bags. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Love all y'all. Bye. All y